Nick went down. Unbelievable. Yes, yes, that's actually- and is now OOP, as they say in dog racing, out of picture. In terms of the college football championship, there, there would be almost uh, no way that uh, these uh, committee people, even if they bring back Condoleezza Rice and uh, she accepts the bribe from Jose Sulaiman, there would seem to be no way that you could somehow work Alabama back in the equation. Is there with two losses? And, and, and possibility that uh, they would have four losses on the season. Well, you can't you can't say that because they won those games. And your man Jimbo, what what's he on? Like a nine game losing streak? That, that's unbelievable. Jimbo Fisher. I don't know how much they've lost in a row. You know. They have not played well the entire year. Like and then Jimbo, like they're talking his bio is like fifty million and they're considering. It. So like that's how bad this is. Imagine that. Fifty million dollars are gonna get this cat that's to fail. Go. <laughs> wow, wow. Did we all make some bad career choices? We should have just been failing college football coaches. The time. Wake up with Defo, joined by Luby. Welcome to the Defo Show. You know, back in the day, and uh, good morning, everybody. Good to be with you here, Jeff DeForest, and uh, very intelligent, intellectual looking Mike Luby Lubitz. <laughs> Are you going into uh, creative writing or something? I mean, uh, what what happened here? Do you normally wear contact lenses? I don't ever recall seeing you in glasses before. I wear contact lenses, and my eye was a little weird yesterday, so we're trying to play it safe. So here is this. I hate this look. With a passion. Well, is this the first time I've ever seen you in glasses? It can't be. I mean, I've known you 12 years, Luby. Uh, how is this possible? I didn't eyes. know you even had a pair of glasses. I didn't know you wore contact lenses. In person, never. I always found a way to, around it. Uh, I think one time in this last year, something happened like this, and I was like, screw it. I'm just going to wear my glasses. It's rare. It's a good look for you, though. It really is. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you, sir. Well, back in the day when I was growing up, I mean, immediately it would be the uh, cause for derision. And uh, you, you would be bullied, uh, you know, about the fact that exactly. you were wearing glasses. You wanted oh, to dodge uh, that like the plague, man. I mean, there weren't any contact lenses back then either. <laughs> when were you born? Defoe to Stone Age? Pretty much. <laughs> <laughs> but immediately the stuff would start like in the second grade. Hey, four eyes. <laughs> look yeah. at this. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, I, I think you look good. I think it's a good look for you. Uh, if anybody has any comments on the chat line here and you want to weigh in early on the program, <laughs> feel free. All of the usual suspects. So we always appreciate your comments. And if anybody new wants to chime in, that would be great, too. Uh, how does Luby look in glasses? I think he looks like a real intellectual. I, I think it adds something to your uh, cerebral credibility, if you will. Thank you. Thank you. So that your opinions will be more respected on the show because you're wearing these glasses here today. Me, I'm a half a wreck, but uh, nonetheless, I was able to get it together just in time to sign yes, on for the show. Did. And uh, we do have a lot of uh, things uh, in the works here today on the program on a Tuesday. Uh, now, now, is this a regular move or is this just uh, a, a once in a blue moon type of thing with John and Jimmy? Uh, is he usually going to be with us on Monday still with uh, yes. Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill and the Pigskin Playbook and all of that? Because, uh, you know, Monday's a good day. Yeah, the college football scene uh, finished up on Saturday. And then, of course, you have the entire NFL and a Monday night game, which was a little bit boring uh, for me because I was getting two points with the Saints and they were hopelessly out of it, it seemed like, from the very start. That was one of those games that was just trending badly. I, I actually watched the Manning cast last night instead of Joe Buck, uh, Joe Buck and uh, Troy Aikman, which, uh, as we've been saying, I, I mean, I, I, look, they're very competent. I, you know, they, they give you the typical broadcast, but I, I don't think it's anything exceptional to you. I mean, is Joe Buck uh, adding any particular brilliance oh. to your enjoyment of the game? He calls a decent game. Uh, you know, uh, he's not my favorite. Uh, I don't know why. There's just something about him. But uh, and, and everybody says he's a super nice guy, decent guy. Uh, we did run into, I, I don't know, I mean, indirectly. Remember, we were in uh, Dallas, I believe, for uh, a Super Bowl. And uh, he was honored by Cheryl DeLeonardis, yep. who has that, uh, that thing uh, with, uh, you, you know, the uh, sportscaster announcer. Uh, awards, sportscaster, uh, you know, awards, sportscaster of the year or whatever. Pat Summerall uh, is uh, the name behind the thing. And Joe Buck got it. You know, and let's face it, it's one of those awards that there are only so many people that could get it. So eventually it's going to come around to you. And that's what I figured with Joe Buck. They were just out of people, you know. <laughs> I received a few awards like that, you know, or not even necessarily awards, but where like uh, uh, Tom Chicka, for example, I remember he used to uh, do the media criticism and uh, write sports for the Sun Sentinel, a long time guy, man. And uh, I, I uh, you know, first uh, discovered and liked Tom because he was handicapping dog races for the Miami News, which uh, there was nothing like getting a full page of dog racing selections, both the matinee and evening performance. 
at the Hollywood Greyhound track, and there was Jicka all over it. And so um, I always had an affinity for Tom Jicka. And then, I don't know, I'd been doing this stuff uh, in the market for about 35 years, and I get a call one day from Jicka. And he, I think he was about to hang it up because he retired shortly after that. And he said, hey, how'd you like to be my subject of the five questions piece that I do where they find a so-called local celebrity or somebody in the media and they ask them five questions and you give answers to make yourself look far more interesting than you actually are. Right. <laughs> like they say, hey, who is your favorite singer of all time? And you say, like, Lena Horne, you know, some Lena 50s Horne. jazz uh, songstress. <laughs> Lena Horn. What, what are you talking about? I know her for Joe Horn. <laughs> oh, exactly. But, uh, but uh, anyway, um, yeah, g- good to be with you here uh, on this day. And uh, John Kajemi is going to join us here today. Uh, we'll do a little pigskin playbook. I uh, weren't able to get to John yesterday. And then Billy Corbin, uh, very appropriate. I mean, uh, nobody more uh, active in terms of uh, political opinions being expressed and thoughts about the city of Miami and the state of Florida and, and what a backwards bozo state we happen to live in. Just incredible. And I mean, just take a red paintbrush out, my friends. That's what it's going to be today. I'm going to go and vote right after the Mike Mayo lunchbox. And, uh, you know, the place that I go, nobody goes to uh, pretty much. It's a Yogi Berra thing. Nobody goes there anymore. It's too crowded. But um, in the primary, I was able to just waltz right in there. In fact, the guy said, hey, you want me to fill this out for you, old man? I mean, whatever you want me to do. It couldn't be any more helpful. There were no prod boys out there, uh, you know, uh, none of the, no Hells Angels hanging out there going, hey, what are you going to do now? Are you going to vote for Charlie Crist? Huh? That <laughs> asshole. <laughs> How futile is a vote for Charlie Crist today? How futile, my friend? It's pretty bad. Yeah, it's pretty bad. What do you think? I mean, uh, why don't I just, uh, I mean, it's probably like these uh, lotto tickets that we all bought last night uh, and still waiting. There's a possibility that during the show, we might become billionaires. Nice. So, I mean, that's always something to look forward to. And, and I really thought I had the winning numbers. I think this delay hurt me. Uh, I, I think had they drawn the balls, uh, you know, the ping pong balls last night when they were supposed to at 1059, I think I would have won. So, okay. <laughs> I love that. And if you're Donald Trump, if you think it, it's it true. Is. <laughs> so where's my 1.9? Exactly. Start yelling about it. Anyway, Corbin uh, is great on any subject, including the University of Miami and uh, all other things uh, related to sports. Uh, but um, I think we'll probably uh, delve heavily into uh, local politics. That's what I want. Yep. Yeah, that, that'll be a lot of fun. He's not a big fan of uh, Mayor Suarez. Oh, no. He's a figurehead. And uh, he, he's down there. I mean, the poly man hit it on the head. And, and this is all you need to know about what's happening here in the state of Florida, because uh, you used to be able to count on Broward County for sure. It would be Democratic very strongly where we live. Palm Beach County, not so much, right? Because they got a lot of rich people that want to protect their uh, tax shelters and all of that other stuff. And, uh, you know, they're, they're uh, b- bogus companies, uh, sham companies they have set up in foreign countries. Well, whatever it is that they're trying to protect, they, they want to keep their money, basically, is the issue there. Uh, and in Dade County, right, I mean, you, you it had a, a Democratic uh, edge to it until... Oddly, all of these uh, immigrants became uh, U.S. citizens and uh, now are voting. And and even if they aren't U.S. citizens, uh, Donnie Boy would tell you they're voting anyway, but they're voting for him. They're voting Republican. Yep. And the poly man they hit it right on the head. I mean, uh, most of the people that came over from Cuba, and uh, this is not to uh, cast, uh, you know, any kind of disparaging shadow or uh, paint them with a broad brush. But right by the bed, they have two pictures, Mother Teresa and Jeb Bush. And that's <laughs> it. <laughs> these are the people they worship. So uh, we'll see what happens there. But uh, that looks like it's going the other direction also. So a very feeble uh, vote will be uh, made today uh, for uh, Val Demings by me. Uh, we're endorsing. These are our public endorsements. And uh, it wouldn't matter who Val Demings was. I mean, they, they could run Ichabod Crane, uh, you know, against Marco <laughs> Rubio. I, I, just, the sight of Rubio just sickens me. It really does. I mean, he's not a bad looking guy. He looks like Will Manso, the sportscaster. Doesn't he does. He? But Manso yeah. doesn't have smarmy. Written all over Man, so seems like a really good guy or a, a truly decent human being. Does he not? He I don't know. He, he may beat his dog or whatever, but he seems like a really nice guy. Just well, the way he comes off on TV. A lot. Well, I've come across him a lot in person, too. And a lot of pe- the same people. He's a good dude. Rubio. Yeah. <laughs> what is the appeal of this man, though? He, he, he looks like and talks like and acts like a real weasel. Yes. We know that he's been bought and paid for by, uh, you know, lobbyists and uh, gun interests and things like that. Um, what is his appeal? I, I don't know what it is. No, I have no idea. And, and surprisingly, he was behind Demings in fundraising 
But uh, and and launched a zero campaign. Now, did he speak of any issues? The only thing is like, we're not going to let them destroy our country. That, that's his new yeah. thing. We're not going to let them destroy our state or our country. Okay, Marco, you're doing a pretty good job of that. That's great. Yeah, yeah. All right, we're going to get right into this. Okay, very good. Uh, I like it. Let's go. Let's get right into a uh, little John Kajemi. Is he uh, joining us uh, visually as well today? He's right yes. There. All right. All right. What's up, guys? Johnny, how are you, my friend? You sound good. You look great. I'm doing fine. How about you guys? Good morning, sir. Yeah, we're just debating uh, the futility of me going across the street here. It's not even across the street. I, I, I literally walked through a gate, and I'm at the uh, place where I'm going to be voting. And, you know, I, I'm a staunch Democrat my whole life. And uh, I, I'm literally like, it, it's like some of those horses I bet in a Breeders' Cup. That, that as soon as I made the, the bet and had the ticket, I may as well just wad it up and throw it away because it, it doesn't look good <laughs> for us. Get in the bathroom, <laughs> get out there anyway. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's right. It's going to be ugly. How are you? I mean, uh, what a wild uh, football weekend we have to discuss. And, you know, of course, uh, an interesting day because we set the clocks back on Saturday. And Luby and I have the theory we're setting the uh, clock back 100 years when it comes to America after today. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, you know, that's not going to be favorable. <laughs> The clock uh, setback stuff always gets me because yeah. I'm riding down the road and I've already adjusted all the clocks and, and everything yeah. in the house. And I get in the car and sometimes it, it adjusts itself. Sometimes it wants to yeah. be adjusted. Yeah. So I never know what time it is in, in the car. And I'm looking at my phone. I'm looking at the car. Which one's right? Uh, did I have my coffee today? Do, do I remember which one I, I set? So it, it's always... Uh, you know, 15 minutes of panic till I figure out what time it is on the road. How, how early when you were with the Finn Siders, uh, uh, John, and, and you're still doing this, I guess. Are, are you still involved in pregame shows at the stadium? Uh, no, I just, just with FOR4, just with Channel 4. Uh, oh, okay. So we'll, yeah. Uh, so TV's I, so much easier, yeah. you only gone five minutes and it's great. Oh, it's the best. It's yeah. the best. No, that's good. Because, uh, uh, yeah, one of my favorite in incidents, and, and at the time he had a much shorter fuse than I would imagine he does now. But uh, I was doing four-hour pregame shows before Dolphin Games with Kim Bocamper. So, oh, of course, good luck with that. Yeah, the time <laughs> change comes. And Bo Camper, of course, forgets to set his clock back. So he, he's, there like, <laughs> he's there like an hour before he's supposed to be. And we're yeah. already going to be there for like four hours. And, and he, I, I come in. I go, hey, Kim, how you doing? He goes, fuck. <laughs> it sucks. <laughs> I can't believe it. I've been here for an hour. I couldn't even get in. I had a pound on the gate. You and, did that uh, pretty good, Defo. That was perfect. <laughs> oh, he was volatile than it meant. I mean, he, he was just as likely to, uh, you know, accidentally crush your head with those giant hands. <laughs> 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 this was before Bo Campers and all the success that he had as a restaurateur. I, oh. I think at the time he was affiliated with a struggling Dodge dealership, uh, you know, the one that had the cow on it. Uh, you know, <laughs> yeah, yeah, by the boy, you know. His name was there. They hadn't sold a car in two months. I mean, he wasn't a happy man that day. Uh, all right. Um, where do you want to start? Do you want to start college, pros? Where, where do you want to Wherever be? Wherever you guys want to. I mean, it was exciting for the Dolphins. It was exciting for LSU. Alabama was awesome. Uh, FSU had a huge night in South Florida. Wherever you guys wow. want to start. All right. Uh, let's start with the Dolphins. That, that was kind of a good thing. Because, uh, you know, we've been saying this for a while. That, uh, you know, if you're not going to be good, which they are good, but uh, at least be exciting. They might have the most dynamic offense uh, with apologies to the Kansas City Chiefs who struggled to score 20 points in overtime. Uh, the Miami Dolphins offense, wow. I mean, uh, those uh, like first seven, eight possessions, uh, they couldn't be stopped. They were amazing. And they managed to kind of, uh, you know, perpetuate that even in the late going in that game when they really needed to. They haven't been stopped, Defo, not only for possessions, but for games and weeks. It's unbelievable how Tyreek Hill, one person, can come in and get into a new offense with a new head coach, and it looks like we have a new quarterback, right? Yeah. It, it made him – it made Tua – all. it accentuated all the things that he does really well, and he's getting better at all the stuff maybe he had some shortcomings at. And, you know, he's still – there's still more points to be had. You know, there, there's still points that, that the Dolphins are leaving out on the field in terms of – if he hits Waddle and Stride, uh, it's it's easy six at the end of the game. Yes, he, yep, yep, you know yep. there's been a, a couple instances where he has that, but he, he everybody forgets the 30 other throws that he made that were perfect. You know, and that we're always thinking about well, there's a couple more. Well, those couple more make it a laugher. Make against bad teams, it's a laugher. 
It's yeah. not you're hanging on to every possession that you have to score uh, all of a sudden because Justin Fields sets an NFL record with his legs, you know, rushing for 176 yards. So it, it's been fun to watch on offense. On defense, it hasn't been. But hopefully, you know, Byron Jones comes back by the 2029 season <laughs> and we're going to be okay. You know, so yeah. ho hopefully that'll straighten itself out. Uh, X has been playing kind of, you know, 80 percent, 70 percent. You know, he's not I don't think he's healthy, but he's out there because I don't think the Dolphins have much of a choice. So now you get an edge rusher and Bradley Chubb who, who looks like the part, you know, in terms of him getting to the quarterback. He has to finish, but he's he's been around the quarterback, you know, for the plays that he had uh, with the Dolphins. And Wilson at running back looks like a great tandem yep. for Mostert. So I think that, you know, the no-name offensive line is starting to, you know, come about and, and play better. So I think this team is, you know, this is their strike zone. I said this on Sunday. This is the, the time of the year where they have to clean up. They have to get the 8, 9, 10 wins uh, in a hurry because you get San Fran on the horizon. You get Buffalo, who went down at home uh, on the horizon, who's going to be better when the Dolphins play them the next time. And then you have those tricky games against New England and the Jets. Now, I don't care if you if you think they're they are mediocre, but mediocre. So it was Detroit and Chicago were less than mediocre yep. and they gave the Dolphins fits. So it'll be a, it'll be tough sledding against those two. John, the offense has been everything we hoped it could be and more. I mean, Tua is finally getting the recognition. People are acting like he wasn't hated on and it's just assumed he's been great when all we heard off offseason was <laughs> Who's next for the Dolphins at quarterback? So that's how good the offense has been. Tyreek Hill is now considered by many the best receiver in football when you weren't hearing that in the offseason. Jalen Waddle is getting top five, top ten receiver. Comps, which he wasn't. The running game is starting to wake up. Um, the offense is what we haven't seen since Dan Marino. I mean, or Dan Marino even in his heyday. The defense is not what we wanted to see. Chubb is supposed to make it better. He was on a, a snap count last week. Or do you think we see finally more of him this weekend? Because I feel like that's what would make the difference is letting – Chubb Phillips loose, and that allows the corners to not have to be on islands all day long, which they've been most of the season. You know, I, I don't know how they're going to work the rotation. I would think he's going to play uh, the majority of the snaps, but you have guys that are, you know, you put Ingram in for one series, and he's the guy that gets the sack. Yeah. You know, after Chubb wears him out, wears him out, wears him out, now you get a different body type coming at you, and he's he gets around the tackle and, and gets the sack. So you have Van Ginkle. You have, you know, like Ogba's in the witness protection program. We're hoping he comes back and, and you know, makes his his presence known on, on the edge. But uh, the Dolphins missed a lot of tackles in that game. And you're going to miss a lot of tackles against Justin Fields. You know, they had guys diving at ankles because there's a guy 6'3", 230 pounds that is the fastest guy on the field. Yeah. And nobody could get him on the ground. And I don't know if you're going to see that type of quarterback as the Dolphins move along. You know, you've got the Texans coming up, you got the Browns coming up, you get a bye week sandwiched in there, and then you get, you know, Garoppolo and and, and guys of that stature, Herbert. So I, I think the Dolphins are going to be okay. They, once they get healthier on defense, I think they're going to be okay. But to your original point, Luby, Chubb's going to play as much as he can. I think he's going to play as many snaps as he can and when you make that substitution, I think you're going to get a hungrier player knowing that I only have X amount of plays to get it done. And it, it puts it puts the pressure on those guys to, to make plays when they get their chances. We were highly uh, critical of uh, McDaniel's uh, decision not to go for a field goal, go for a uh, fourth down play against the Pittsburgh Steelers. Nearly cost them a game. That, that was a couple of weeks ago. So uh, what did you make of his decision to uh, forsake the field goal try and go for a fourth down, which failed, which on the scoreboard then the dynamic uh, changed dramatically as we came down the stretch there? Because uh, the truth was, uh, you know, uh, where uh, the Dolphins uh, victimized by what should have been a pass interference call, you're in a tight ball game there. That, yeah. That put them in field goal range right there, if not a losing situation. So uh, – no, it's the old thing when you put your hand on a stove. Uh, do you go back and uh, put your palm right on there again after you turn it up to high just to see if it's heated up? Uh, what did you think of that? What, what did you make of that decision? I thought against the Steelers it was a no-brainer to kick the field goal only yeah. because of the opponent you were playing that night. The Steelers didn't look like they could move the football 
uh, you know, against St. Thomas Aquinas if they yeah. happen to come on the field. That well, night. I know it was going to make a six point margin, a nine point margin. Which it, it was going to make it a yeah. two score game. Yeah. But even if it was in the same scenario as Chicago, I felt like they should have kicked it against the Steelers because it puts the game out of reach, just like going for it on fourth down and icing the yeah. game that way. Against Chicago, I, I was more in the middle of the road because I felt like, yes, the Dolphins had played complimentary football, but the compliment came courtesy of the special teams and, and six points by blocking a punt. It didn't really come as part of the defense of becoming up, make, making stops and being consistent all day. And I felt like if your offense couldn't be stopped all afternoon, give them the best chance to go out and close the game out because you didn't want to leave it in the hands – you didn't think Chicago was going to score seven. They may get they may get three, but you didn't think they were going to drive the field and score seven. So I felt like the Dolphins, when you look at the result, it was an incompletion, but they had exactly what they wanted. They, they should have put the game away. I think it was a body language type of miscommunication where Smythe turned his head upfield at the last minute yeah. where Tua was ready to deliver the football, and he had hesitation, and, and it just, you know, threw like a, a sinker into the ground, but um, I felt I felt more confident with him going for it there. I, I see the point of kicking, um, but I do see them feeling like you know what the offense has been the beat the chest type of of unit all day. We're going to win it with those guys. I'd rather go down with our hot hand than leaving it to the field of well, you know what we had a chance we didn't take it. You know they couldn't stop us all afternoon, so I, I was okay. I was I was better with that situation than I was against the Steelers. Uh, more understandable, uh, no question. Uh, have they lost a little faith in Sanders, who used to be Mr. Reliable? But now, I mean, where guys are kicking, uh, you see these stats on kickers in the pros uh, and, uh, you know, diametric opposition to what you're seeing in college, where uh, a guy inside of 50 is usually perfect, or, yeah. you know, you'll see the stat, oh, well, he's made his last 35 from inside of 40 yards. Uh, right. But Sanders is uh, kicking at 70%. Uh, have they lost a little faith in this guy? Is that possible? I don't know. I may, maybe behind the scenes, uh, they might have. I still think he's, you know, a kicker that should get it done. The guy works hard. The guy's got the yeah. right. You he know, was dynamite. Tools. At one time. Yeah, I, I still have confidence in him, and I wouldn't have minded seeing him trot out on the field and make that field goal, given the chance. I'm sure he wanted that other opportunity to come out and and kind of seal the game that way. But um, yeah, you're right, Defoe. It seems like guys from 55, or you know. 15 out of 16. Yeah. How, how many how many attempts do they have again? You know, from 50 yards plus? It, it's crazy. But as you get closer to, you know, it, it seems like they're missing more. Uh, Sanders is missing more kicks in that intermediate zone or that chip shot range instead of, you know, the 52, 57, 58 yard. Yeah, never good uh, when you can't count on your kicker. Uh, all of a sudden he's got a gyroscope and a ball and it's going all <laughs> over the place. But uh and, and, you know, you wouldn't want a coach necessarily to lose his courage completely. I mean, I, I don't know that you have to be Brandon Staley, you know, and go for it all the time on fourth down. But, uh, you know, you, you do like to see, I mean, uh, people are always complaining. Uh, of course, you had the whole Tony Sperano thing uh, about being too conservative. And, and, and I was never a fan of that. So I, I don't necessarily want to see McDaniel completely give up on the idea of going for it in certain spots. But uh, this one was less uh, from the uh, dynamics of the scoreboard. Uh, you know, uh, less egregious than not putting the uh, second score on the board that would have to be achieved by Pittsburgh uh, when they were going nowhere, as you said, offensively. So, uh, you know, probably not as critical uh, of a situation. Uh, all right, so the uh, Dolphins moved to 6-3. and three. They have a couple of soft games uh, coming up, or at least uh, what would appear to be very winnable games, and puts them in a good spot, puts us in a good spot with the over eight and a hook, you would have to think. Well, do we have to sweat that out, John? Well, what's your opinion? How you know, could they not win nine games from here? They, they have this, is why, yeah. this is why I don't gamble, Defo. Um, <laughs> the last two weeks now. Look at me. I, I think, I've already, I'm counting the money already. I think, I think the Dolphins covered against Detroit. Yes. But when I saw the line, I was like, it could be 14, and I would have slammed the Dolphins, right? I would have been like all over the Dolphins. They're going to kill Detroit. Yeah. Detroit plays great. Same scenario with the Bears. I, I looked at the line, and it was – only a couple of points. Four points, yeah. And I'm going, how, how can that be? The Dolphins have got to be, you know, at least touchdown to a touchdown and a few close to a field goal favorite in this game. You know, I would have been all over the Dolphins. 
So now you have the Browns and the Texans. I would think it's going to be the same scenario. It's going to be a little bit more. I haven't. Uh, I haven't really four point looked. line. Uh, four point line at home against the Browns. See that, which that, is kind that, of conservative. See now that one, I, I yeah, I could see uh, you know go ahead and bang in the uh, Dolphins on, but uh, the Bears surprisingly, I mean, were not who we thought they were. If you watched their game the week prior, uh, it, it seemed like there was a metamorphosis, some kind of epiphany, something hit Justin Fields. And while they were trading away their better players, uh, you know, and obviously uh, move towards next year and whatever the uh, future, however distant down the road, they're going to be good again. Uh, Fields seemed to have found something the week before. I, I was watching that game. Against the Cowboys? I'm, yeah, and I'm thinking, wow, this, this, this kid's game. starting to pick it up. Yeah, yeah. Patriots, I guess it was, yeah. Oh, the Patriots, I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, whatever, whoever they played the prior week, uh, Fields looked really, really good. I mean, he looked like a different guy than he did a year ago when we saw him. And I thought, wow, th this kid could be trouble. So the four-point line uh, didn't really surprise me that much, uh, especially since the Finns were on the road. And and they have, uh, you know, I mean, I don't know that they're playing in our competition, but they're in a lot of tight games, no doubt. Yeah. Well, they're, they're playing a lot of fourth-quarter games where they have to continue to apply the pressure offensively. And on, honest, uh, you look at this defense, they probably play poor for three quarters and play their best football – you know, where they get a stop somehow at the end. They, they get off the field and they give an opportunity for the Dolphins to continue that, uh, you know, that passing game that's been unstoppable with uh, a hint of run. And, and I think the run is, you know, if, they, if the Dolphins can run for 70, 80 yards, that's like running for 140 yards for other teams <laughs> because they're throwing the football so much yeah. and, and they're staying on the field and, and it keeps the defense honest. It keeps them yes. guessing. You know, they can't really – they can't really hone in on, on Tua because now you got to go man coverage and you're one step away from making it another touchdown yep. with Hill. Yeah, last year, too, I mean, uh, their running backs were eh, at best run of the mill, small guys that uh, seem to get knocked around a little bit. And uh, as you mentioned, with this guy, uh, Wilson and then Mostert, uh, that's a nice duo. And, and it's uh, two guys that McDaniel has familiarity with. Uh, Wilson walked right in there and picked up the game right away. And uh, Mostert's been running really hard. So. Uh, you know, you, you've improved uh, the, the quality of the guys that are carrying the football for you also. So, uh, you know, that, that certainly looks like an area of the game where, where they're eligible to improve. Uh, all right. Uh, a lot of other things happen around the NFL. Uh, John Kajemi with us here in the Pigskin Playbook brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill, mile marker 104. And that's the overseas highway in Key Largo. And, you know, it, it's interesting, too, because we're, we're right about, I guess, the halfway point of the season. Now you will see changes. So uh, what did you think of this? I would imagine during your career as uh, both a quarterback and an analyst, uh, you probably came across Frank Reich. Yes. At, uh, at some, you know, P played juncture. against them actually. Yeah. They yeah. In college. Oh, wow. Uh, he, did he orchestrate one of those wild comebacks? I actually left that game when, when Frank Reich came back against the university of Miami. Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember that game. Jimmy was coaching and, uh, yeah. I, I left at halftime. My buddy and I, we were doing some uh, video work, and we, we had to go to Ocala after the game. We were videotaping some stuff at the game. We'd already taken care of that. So we're watching a game. We were big Canes fans, and we're like, yeah, let's get out of here. So uh, we jump in the car, and we started to lose the signal. It became scratchy as we were approaching uh, at our points outside of Palm Beach, and we couldn't believe it. They lost the game. <laughs> It, it was uh, one of the most amazing comebacks, uh, you know, and that was like Luby walking out on that uh, game against San Antonio with a few <laughs> seconds to go after it looked like the Heat were going to lose the series. And uh, all of a sudden they had Ray Allen hit that shot at the corner and Luby's face was pressed to the glass of the door. Going, Let me in. Let me in. <laughs> they wouldn't do it. But um, I mean, Frank Reich had a winning record uh, with Indianapolis. Yeah. I, I don't know that the Colts. Uh, I guess in some of the preseason scenarios, uh, then they were getting some favorable reviews. They picked up Matt Ryan. He turned out to be a shot fighter. Uh, were you surprised that Wright got fired? And, and then the announcement that Jeff Saturday was coming in out of nowhere with uh, a limited amount of high school coaching experience uh, as the interim head coach. Uh, I mean, that was that was kind of out of left field, was it not? It was. And, and first of all, with, with Frank Wright, yeah, I was kind of surprised. I mean, Indianapolis isn't having the season they thought they may have. I didn't know if they were going to be a, a playoff contender, even bringing Matt Ryan in and, and kind of a veteran quarterback. They, they've had that quarterback carousel going on for now, I don't know, four or five years, and they really haven't found uh, you know, a young guy to, to come in either in free agency or, or a young guy to take the reins. 
to be able to, you know, handle this offense and be able to lead this team. So that, that was a surprise uh, to me, but yeah, when you bring a guy in that isn't on the staff, that isn't in the NFL in terms of an assistant coach or a coordinator, but a guy that's, you know, uh, an analyst that's coaching high school football. I mean, Jeff has all the experience you would need in terms of knowing how an NFL team should run and should look and how, how it can be constructed. Uh, there's a lot to be said for some of those centers that they're as smart or smarter than the guy that's behind them because they're orchestrating everything uh, with the offensive line in conjunction with the quarterback. So I think that there's a lot to be said for, for linemen that have that position and had it and played it for, at such a high level. But it is awfully strange that you would you would go in that direction in terms of there's got to be someone on that staff that you would have enough confidence in uh, to name the interim head coach and maybe bring Jeff Saturday in as a, a, a special consultant. And, I guess and he was a good. consultant, I guess, with the team. Uh, he you know. was, but but more of a, a day-to-day type of guy in the meetings, constructing the meetings, assisting that uh, interim head coach and working in conjunction with that guy. Because I would think if, if Jeff probably was offered a position already, I think he was a couple of years ago, as an offensive line coach and kind of turned it down that maybe he didn't want the lifestyle of what the NFL in terms of being a, a coach and the hours that you have to put in, uh, bring you on a, on a yearly basis. So maybe he turned the corner and felt like, you know, I'm going to give this a shot and, and continued to just have those conversations with Jim Irsay in the background. Seems odd. I mean, you're halfway through the season and you would think, all right, you're going to fire the head coach. Maybe you think they need to hear a different voice or whatever. Maybe he voiced uh, some opinions that weren't uh, necessarily particularly flattering about Jim or say well, whatever. We don't know what happened there, except that uh, he had a losing record. It wasn't horrendous. It wasn't like they were 0-8. I-, I think, what, 3-5-1? and one Well, they're, they're basically two games out. I mean, yeah. really, when you look at it, the Titans are 5-3, and three, and the Titans don't look like – I mean, their defense looks pretty good, but they're not going to score – 17 points or more in a game, it looks like, until if, if Tannehill comes back. And even if he does, uh, they're still going to be a run first team. It's kind of crazy, though. You, you usually take the tight ends coach, right? And, uh, you know, you elevate them to interim head coach, and then you deal with the right. permanent position after the season. And, and, you know, if you're the interim guy, naturally you're hoping to get the job. But uh, to, to just come in, you know, out of nowhere, uh, very, very unusual, uh, you know, where – you know, and, and it's not like, uh, you know, he was a coach up until last year and had 20 years in the league. I mean, as you were saying, I, I think, I don't know, he might have had one of those token things like, uh, you know, where he was hanging around his uh, old high school and helping out, uh, you know, with some Woody Hayes type that had been there for 50 years. Never coached. You know, as a nice presence. But uh, it, it would be weird to just walk in there on a Monday and start running a show, wouldn't it? I mean, yes. uh, you know everything there is to know about uh, football, played quarterback in uh, different levels. Uh could you just uh, waltz into the uh, Colts locker room on Monday and go, hey, I'm John Kajemi. <laughs> <laughs> Listen to me. It, it would be, it would be, uh, I mean, he has the, he has the cachet and he has the experience that the players will respect him because of yeah. what he did. And I, I think that he's going to be more of a facilitator than dictator. Okay. okay. I, I think that he's going to be more of an organizer to say, this is how, it should look and how it should be done. And he's going to coach through his assistants to let them know that this is how we're going to, this is how we're going to alter things. This is how, this is my vision from looking from the outside of what this team needs. And I think that's what probably why he has this position now, because he was a consultant for Jim or saying for the Colts. And this conversation has probably gone on for months uh, back and forth with owner and Saturday of this is what I would have done. This is how this is what we should do. This is what you should do. And it probably got to the point where, well, if you're so smart, I'm going to give you the job and I'm going to surround you with some people that bring in whoever you need to get it done. But we need to turn it around and I'm I'm making a change. So that's my guess on it. Yeah. Uh, Maybe they just turned the page, uh, you know, to an even further chapter and becoming more irrelevant this year. It's possible. But Saturday, well-respected and a good guy. Seems like a genuine. I mean, they're tanking. I mean, it's clear what they're doing. And I appreciate John. They're tanking. I mean, the Colts are the one team, the one organization that really knows how to tank. 
They tank as well as anyone. Instead of going and getting a Fitzpatrick like the Dolphins, who could win, they went with freaking Curtis Painter and Kerry Collins, who had been retired for three years. Uh, like when the Colts tank, they tank, and it's what they're doing. I mean, they're not even hiding it. Like you're right, yeah. they're right. They're in the discussion for the division. They don't want to win the division and get rocked <laughs> in the first round. Like it, they are looking for the next Andrew Luck. This is a draft that is full of quarterback talent, and they're like, oh, we're pretty bad. All right. Hey, Jeff. Like Jeff, he's never coached ever. He's on an ESPN set. Like, the, the players will listen to him because he's a Hall of Famer and he's on ESPN. But, like, he's never coached at all. Like, I mean, this is 100%, at least to me, them going full on tank. And they're not even being apologetic about it. It was weird, well, though, too. When Did you see Saturday when he was introduced yesterday? No, I didn't see that. He had a suck for luck shirt. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> they brought At the press conference. Luck attire, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Luby's on to something, I think. I, I mean, mean that, that's that's an odd maneuver, right? Well, you, when you really think about it, when you drill down, I mean, okay, so now Jeff Saturday is the interim head coach. He's not going to call plays. He's not. He, he's going to be more of a. Does you he know, even know the plays? Does he know any well, plays? No, <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. He's going to be more of a. A crossing guard <laughs> yeah. officer, really. You know, you, come on, you do this this way. I like, I like, I like that looks good. <laughs> hey, uh, Joe, I, I told you to stop. I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't know because the same people are going to be calling the plays on both sides of the ball. Yeah. So may, maybe it's more about uh, the, his message that that might resonate with other people to get him to play. I, I don't know. It, it's definitely out of the box thinking by Ursay, but when you have an owner. Like Jim Mersey, I, I don't know. Yeah, I'm surprised he didn't bring in Brian Flores and tell him to lose every game uh, from a couple of hundred grand. <laughs> I mean, it's been done before. All right, the shocker on the pro slate, obviously, was the uh, Jets over the Buffalo Bills. So win outright, never mind taking the points or any of that stuff. And we looked at Zach Wilson uh, the week before. It certainly was problematic. I mean, he was throwing picks, as we like to say, like he was passing out bar mitzvah invitations. And they were ugly picks and, and stupid plays. Uh, Robert Sala, you kind of held his cool on that, although he hinted, you know what it's like, quarterback. You don't like to be called out by the coach. Well, you know what? If can Jimmy could throw the ball to somebody in our color uniform, it would be <laughs> nice. <laughs> it hits you, you know, a little bit. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm sensitive to criticism. You know, we, we have the occasional freak that calls up and says, uh, you suck to force. And, you know, I'm thinking, man, do I suck? I don't know. Maybe he's got a point. Uh, but uh, Salah wasn't uh, overly critical, although he did call out uh, Zach Wilson. I, I don't know that Wilson was a huge catalyst. I didn't see all of the game. Uh, obviously, he held him, uh, you know, held himself, uh, you know, acquitted himself very well. But um uh, yeah, that, that was a shocker. I, I was ready to concede the Bills to, to run the table and, and end up uh, whatever it would be, like 19-1 and one at the end of the year, one short of uh, the yeah. season. You had the feeling the Bills were going to win this division by two or three games, you yeah. know, because they were going to trip up one time maybe uh, against a really quality opponent, but they were going to go at the worst 5-1 and one in the division, right? They're going to New England always seems to get them somehow, some way when you don't think they are. But this this time it was the New York Jets. And the Dolphins have already beat him, you know, down here at Hard Rock Stadium. So in the division, the Bills kind of have some issues now. You know, they, they and they have a, a quarterback that's not 100%. Yeah. You know, Tommy John, I mean, uh, did you ever have the ulnar nerve? Uh... I don't know. I, I don't know what it is in there, but some, something, it, it just Everything's tingling. Right. Uh, Everything's right. moving, Yeah. <laughs> It's like me on the third mile of my walk of life where the leg starts tingling and you feel like Mick Tinglehoff. You know, you're like, whoa, whoa, what is that? And then you're thinking, I'll just tough it out. But uh, apparently, I mean, I, I was thinking, geez, isn't that like Tommy John type of stuff where, where you have the. I don't know that much about it, Defo, no. but it, he looked like Rodney Dangerfield in Caddyshack. You know, my arm, my arm. I don't know. <laughs> I, it, it's, it's one of those things that. It, Shame, it, too, because he was doing great. He's a hell of a football player. And yeah. he's, he's he's tough. So you know that you know this has got to be something that it's out of his control. You just can't you know kind of like grind through this. Um, so this could be this could be trouble for the Buffalo Bills just at, at the midseason point where you're going to start to play some home games. The weather's going to start to get nasty, and you're going to have the advantage down the stretch. You want to have all of your you know you want to have your main horse healthy and, and rolling, and, and it doesn't seem like the Bills are, are in that fashion right now. 
That was certainly an awakening. Uh, now, uh, what, what legitimacy does that give to the New York Jets, in your opinion? Well, just you, you have to say the Jets have two really good corners. And when you can control an opposition by shutting down their passing game or at least limiting their passing game or worried about where you're going to throw it in the secondary, uh, that creates some hesitation. and It kind of changes your game or your offensive philosophy, I think. And the Buffalo Bills are as dynamic as anybody in the National Football League at throwing the football down the field. They couldn't get anything going. Even when this is before, uh, you know, Josh Allen's arm was injured, right? So I, I think this is going to – the Jets feel like they can play with anybody right now in the, in the division. They, you know, they've already beaten the Dolphins once. Uh, I, they could be if – they, if they can control – the turnovers in terms of not giving it away on offense, it could be a, a very tough team to play against because it almost feels like when you look at their head coach, that's the way their team is. They're resilient. They're a tough team. They're gonna. They're not going to give up. They're not going to lay down. And that's the feeling when you look at Salah, but when you watch the team, you, you go, yeah, I can see how that message resonates with the way they play. Probably if you ask uh, 100 people uh, that are football fans uh, and watch the uh, AFC uh, who, who the best team is, they would immediately say the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, and yet uh, the Chiefs, uh, for some reason, I mean, uh, they, they look like they're in a position to just run away and hide, much like the Bills. And uh, then, you know, you watch a game like they played on Sunday night, you're thinking they're suspect they're aspects of their game too. Yeah, Yeah, they're beatable. Yeah, it's almost like, you know, Roger Goodell sent a message to the Chiefs and the Bills and, hey, let's keep this thing close, guys. Let's, <laughs> let's, you know, let's not run away. And, you think and this hide. came from FanDuel? Uh, I, I don't chance? know. It's, it's, it's <laughs> funny how, how that happens if both teams, you know, kind of just tank it in the same week. But, you know, you're right. You, you feel like if, I, if somebody was going to ask me who the two best teams are, I, I would definitely say those two. And then, you know, the Dolphins have to be in the, in the conversation – right behind them, the way they're playing on offense. I don't see anybody else in, in the AFC that that can score points, that can uh, do the things that Miami's doing right now on offense. I don't care who you're rooting for. I, I, I hate really bad officiating. I just do. Uh, you know, and especially with the, the pass interference calls. Oh, where, they're brutal. I mean, well, well, I mean, the Dolphins benefited greatly from uh, what I thought was a very uh, questionable pass interference call where – uh, Tua, again, throws a long ball short uh, to uh, a guy who's got two steps on the uh, defensive back. Uh, he comes back to the ball, causing the defensive back, who is looking at the ball, to bump into him. Uh, yeah. it, it certainly was, uh, you know, no intention in terms of committing a foul. Now, uh, sometimes you just have to go ahead and, and throw the flag. In this case, he barely got brushed. They, they throw the flag in the end zone, and the Dolphins get the ball on a one-yard line and subsequently score. There's, you know, I mean, the the differential in the ball game right there, and and then I mean, th there's an official looking right at this. There, there are yeah. two guys. Now, now you're, you're going to have to if you're an official in that spot. It's like you're a left field umpire in a World Series. You're going to make one call in the six games. All right, so maybe your mind drifts off a little bit. You're looking at the chick in the second row or whatever because you haven't really done anything. But but that one call could be the crucial call. Right now, there's an official literally standing right on the spot. I understand, you know, sometimes a guy gets screened, whatever, but two guys are, are literally gang raping the Chicago Bears uh, wide receiver who uh, then gets a hand on the ball, could have easily caught it, and uh, ends up not making a play, and no flag is thrown there. I mean, that's atrocious. I, I don't, does the league well, – we've been saying this forever, but does the league not have a big problem there? And I, I know people don't want to see more things subjected to instant replay, but – I mean, that's one that you're, I mean, people are all watching in the stadium. They see the thing on a scoreboard and they, they're thinking, my God, if that's not a penalty, then what is? Yeah, both of those instances, I think the Dolphins greatly, you know, were on the, on the benefit side of, of no doubt. getting the calls because at the end of the game, I've noticed over the last few years now, at the end of game scenarios where, you know, it might be the last ditch effort for a team to throw one down the field. Guys are pushing and shoving and grabbing each other's yes. arms, and nobody can go up and get a pat. You know, didn't make a, an attempt to catch the football, and there was no flags. Most of the time, it's on hail marys in the end zone, where it just looks like a you know a rugby scrum where they're yeah. throwing the football in, you know, in from out of bounds. Everybody's just pulling everybody down by the jersey. 
it, it's a uh, it's a tough scenario to catch the football. But you're right. Keon Crossan had his arms draped around the Bears uh, wide receiver, dragging him away from the football, and there's no call. And the first one you talked about in Tyreek Hill, he comes back and, and causes the interference sure. in terms of fighting through the defender, and you get the call. So, yeah, I, I don't know. But I don't think the league's going to do anything about that. I, I know that – you know, there's challenges underneath two minutes that can only be directed by the booth. I don't know if they're going to ever get to the point where under two minutes the booth has a, a call or can override a call that's not made or made on the field in terms of interference. But I think it has to, some has to be addressed because the only thing you can do as a team. So now Chicago is going to send those plays into the league and they're going to go, you know what? Sorry, guys, you're right. We we screwed those up. Sorry, but, well, but we lost the game. Yeah, you know we, we just, we're still in the game. It's huge, it's, but maybe those calls don't happen, especially the one at the end of the game. I, we have the ball on the twenty yard line, and we're we're going in to score. Uh, they they were in a position there. They would have tied the ball game up, and yeah, you know, in all likelihood, at the very Could least, and, and had a chance to win it, which uh, yeah. You know, it would have been a very unfortunate result for the Dolphins, but uh, by any measure and any standard of the rules, you had to throw a flag in that spot there. And, and if you can challenge a spot, which is very intangible and somewhat vague and a challenge where a ball is being spotted, I would think at some point in the game you should allow you know a coach to at least have one challenge against uh, the very subjective uh, rules that, that are in play there, which, uh, you know, I mean, they may get there, Defoe. They yeah. may get to that point because a disaster before yeah. when they did it. That's it it'll doing. be a disaster, but maybe, maybe right. they've, maybe it's one call. Maybe you one get call, one yeah. call. Right. Yeah. If you could challenge one, one play a game, then uh, you would think that coaches would save it for the end. Now I, I'm not a fan of a ticky tack call. Like you, you watch a basketball game and a guy barely gets brushed, but they give it to LeBron. They put him on the line for two and he wins the ball game. Uh, you know, and, and you don't want to see teams uh, win or lose in, in that fashion based on, a, you know, a very lame, questionable call. But, uh, you know, I'm also not a fan of just completely swallowing the whistle, you know, where you've been calling something the entire game. Then all of a sudden with the game on the line, you let it go. Uh, you know, it makes no sense. And, and it kind of makes uh, the calls that you made throughout the ball game sort of irrelevant also. And meaningless, really. Yeah. You're going by the book and now all of a sudden you throw the book out the window. Yeah. Like I do at the first tee whenever I have the USGA rules book. <laughs> yeah, so what's this for? We, we used to have a this. book burning right there on the first tee. All right, uh, it's out, the book. I mean, uh, and people are raving about it. Uh, Jimmy Johnson's uh, book, uh, Swagger, with Dave Hyde and uh, you know, my beloved New York Post, uh, Steve Serby, uh, excellent uh, NFL, longtime NFL writer, uh, had a little review uh, of the book, and he says it's outstanding, all, all kinds of good stuff in there, highs and lows, and Jimmy, obviously, very candid. Dave, a talented writer. And uh, we're still a little envious, John, that, that you were down there just a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I was cheating big time, guys. Jimmy what a day Jones I had. Chill, yeah. It was, it was perfect. Hang. It was perfect place to hang for a day. Um, had great food, uh, great scenery, uh, nice camaraderie. Had my family down with me. Uh, hung out at the Tiki Bar and had a few drinks, watched some of the games there, and then kind of went into the sports bar and uh, had a slice of pizza and then kind of went up top to the rooftop on top of the beautiful accommodations they have at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill and had dinner and celebrated my brother's 50th birthday. So I uh, had a great time. Uh, missed you guys down there, but hopefully we can get down there very soon. And um, I think it's kind of on us. I, I think we're going to have to uh, pick up the phone and, and call Larry and Dominic and Amanda and and they're they are waiting with open arms. They said. All right, good, good. Well, uh, we'll get that together uh, now. Uh, Mayo, I think, will be a, a big fan of the Italian fisherman pizza. Jim Sarney, though, a little more curmudgeon like when it comes to I think the, the things that he likes. And, and you know, he, he's a straight cheese and sauce guy when, when it comes okay. to pizza. That's okay. We'll make. He, he could get him. that, but but wouldn't you suggest? I mean, what could we tell him about this? Italian fisherman pizza that that would convince him that it's at least worth a shot, you know, to invest. You know, in what, you know what we're going to tell him that we, he should stick to what he likes. That way, there's more for us. Yeah, with the fisherman's pizza, right? <laughs> I, I think Jim should stay. Yeah, there are only eight slices. You're right. Just take that, Jim. Go in the corner over there. Your seat's right there. 
I'll pick the scallops and the <laughs> lobster off there and the calamari and just that's say, right. hey, here you go, Jim. Here, try this. Uh, that'd be great. Uh, no, there's something for everybody there. That, that's a good thing. Jimmy Johnson's big chill. The vibe is great. Uh, that'll be fantastic. Now, uh, once this schmutz clears out, uh, which I don't think it's going to impact the keys much. But, no, I uh, think the keys are, are in the clear right now. Who yeah. knows? You watch the Weather Channel. You want to talk about laughter. That's great. That's great comedy there. Oh, those squiggly lines, man. They, they drive me out of my mind. I, it looks like my intestines after a big meal. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's crazy. I'm like, ah, do, I, do I go to the bathroom? What? Uh, no, but I, it's supposed to be spectacular, I think, uh, this coming weekend after all of this stuff clears out. You know, the calm after the storm. That's right. So, or right before the storm, but uh, before and after. And I, I think it's going to be a good weekend to get down there. Jimmy Johnson's big chill. And uh, we will make arrangements to get there. We, we, we promise. John, we'll all get on board. Uh, we'll have to have a little staff. Uh, what do we do? Do we do a uh, a call, a conference call? Uh, yeah, we'll do one of those. We'll, we'll get we'll get all get together. Cool. We'll get Tommy call. Fox up here. That's on the right. Screen. Yeah, Luby will orchestrate. What do you think about Luby's glasses, by the way? I like them. Yeah, I like them, Luby. I don't recognize the guy when he uh, came up uh, today on the screen. I was like, uh, "Who's the intelligent guy here? What, what am I? You know, well, uh, raising the game here." And uh, it was Luby. Never seen him with glasses. You know what? You should give those to Mario Cristobal. He's gonna be, he would be shocked at what he's seeing out on the field right now. All right, we'll get into that. We'll get into some uh, college football. There's a lot more there, uh, obviously, on a pro slate with John Kajemi here. On the Defo Show, uh, John usually with us Mondays, 8 to 9, uh, and uh, we move things around even today. Uh, Billy Corbin's going to join us later on. Uh, you know Billy. He's a hoot. I mean, uh, yeah. have you come across him uh, uh, You know, in, in your travels around town? Just know of him, yes. Yeah, no, he, he's great with Cocaine Cowboys and all of these documentaries he made, the, the stuff on the U. Huge UM fan. All you have to do with Billy, you know what's great? It's a, it's an easy interview, John, and you can appreciate this being in the business, of course, as long as you have, where uh, you know two guys are like this. Well, a few guys are like this. Don King, you say to Don King, hey, Don, how you doing? And like an hour later, he, he's finished. Uh, and, and with Billy Corbin, all you have to do is say, hey, Billy, how you doing? Donna Shalala. <laughs> and he goes, he goes fucking crazy. I mean. <laughs> Starts condemning everything that's happened in Miami since 1875. Even the Flaglers are a fair game. It's incredible. <laughs> All right, uh, back with more in a moment with John Kajemi. The Pigskin Playbook continues here on the Defo Show on South Florida Live. In a moment, not that. The time. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously, friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, <laughs> no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes, really, really good food, amazing atmosphere, good for a family, good for a date, or just a night out for yourself, and prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched, steaks hand cut every day. Everything, and I mean everything, is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. Line Dolphins with John Kajemi, and that's brought to you by Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill. <laughs> In the Keys, and we're looking very much forward to doing some broadcasts there. I think we're going to head down there like once a month during the football season. I have to ask you this, on you know, and feel free to you know not necessarily spill the beans uh, from a personal standpoint to your good friend Dan Marino. Does he experience or did he ever experience nightmares about handing the ball off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar that one year when Jimmy <laughs> insisted on running the ball on every play? And uh, it, it was always, I mean, uh, the announcer, I think it was Ron St. John was a stadium announcer back then, and you could hear him say, hand off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, gain of one, second and nine. Hand off to Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, gain of one, third and eight. <laughs> Did he ever talk about that? Remember no, that he's never days. really talked about that, Defoe. But you're right. I think they did have that on loop at whatever the stadium was called. At <laughs> yeah, time. it was one yard every time. 
And it was a generous one yard they were giving him statistically. Enjoy your trip to work with lots of laughs, thanks to Defo and Luby. Now on the Defo Show. Naturally, uh, you mentioned the word degenerate, and people uh, immediately cast aspersions upon a character of the people that are involved. But uh, there are some good things uh, about being a degenerate. And we, we have John Kajemi with us. Uh, doesn't fit that category, but uh, might have some leanings. I don't know. In another lifetime, John, you have some tendencies, Default. Degenerate. Yeah, some tendencies. Yeah. <laughs> As someone who doesn't seem like a degenerate, it's a little interesting the knowledge he does have. Yes, people. yes. Pretends he's all around a point spread, but he knows it's four points. I mean, come on. I, I really didn't. I, I really didn't. I, I figured it was going to be higher. Uh, well, uh, that being said, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, one of the nice traditions, uh, at least, uh, you know, if you're in certain groups. Uh, now, where I uh, frequent uh, the paramutual facility I go to uh, is now, I guess, Harris. Uh, it's Harris. It used to be the Isle. It was Pompano Park. And uh, it's closest to my house. It's like a 10-minute uh, pop. So that, that's where I'm going to head if I'm going to bet my simulcast, even though I love it at, at Hialeah Park. And not to be defensive about it, but it just – it would be a long drive for me back and forth uh, there to uh, get down there every day uh, when I'm punching away for maybe an hour or two. But um, I, I can picture all of the characters, and, and this is kind of a tradition. And that's why I, I wish I'd been at Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill over the weekend. And uh, whether you're talking about uh, Omar Sharif uh, – his name is Omar. We call him Sharif. Uh, Ticket Billy, uh, Craig, uh, any of the bigs, Al or Rich, uh, any of the other guys that are out there. Uh, a guy makes a score, and it's drinks for everybody, you know, in the group. And I would have been buying shots of tequila for the entire bar, watching Nick Saban go down on that Brian oh, Billy two-point conversion. How how delightful was that, John and Jimmy? What yeah, a game. I mean, you're, you're bigger into college football than I am uh, by far. Mm -hmm. And uh, yet I, I, I couldn't help. I mean, I, I, I leaped out of bed, even though my knee was killing me and uh, just said, uh, you know, th this is this is the greatest day of my life. It, it would be like seeing <laughs> some of my candidates actually win election after today and, uh, you know, actually be in the Senate and, and the gubernatorial seat. You know, given the pleasure of putting Nick Saban aside for one second, if you yeah. could appreciate just the game. Yeah, I mean, yeah. both of those quarterbacks uh, willed their teams yeah. Kind of to you know to to win you know I I wouldn't say that either team deserved to lose that game you know when you feel like that at the end of the game where you're going you know what yeah. even though putting Nick Saban on the sidelines and not worrying about who the head coach is for Alabama I, I really felt bad for Alabama because Bryce Young did everything he could you know you're thinking about the Heisman and this is a Heisman moment and he's going to do it again and then he does it again. Uh, he, you know, gets them into a position where they kick the field goal, they get the overtime. And then the last person in the world I thought would go for it, you know, would, would have been Brian Kelly only because, uh, I, I think if LSU does not score on the very first play offensively of overtime, they probably don't go for two, but I think that emotion and that momentum and that surge of energy that, Hey, let's strike while the iron's hot. You know, let we've got them. On, we've got them on their heels. Let's not extend this game where where Alabama is the better team at the end of the day. They find a way to win again. Let's go ahead and do it. And and hey, how about our new hometown hero and Mason Taylor? You know, catching yeah. the yes. the touchdown, the touchdown first, and then the two point conversion. And uh, you know, proud mama and dad for sure uh, in South Florida. It's amazing, too. I mean, uh, even if you go back historically, the, the margins of difference between greatness and being an also-ran, where you had uh, that Kenny Calhoun play comes to mind, Dr. Tom Osborne going for two there in the Orange Bowl game. Uh, what was that, the 84 Orange Bowl, yeah. 83 season, when the Canes mm -hmm. won their first national championship. And if this guy doesn't get a fingertip on the ball, uh, it's probably caught, and uh, the hurricane run doesn't get started. Who knows what, what happens uh, after that? Uh, and, and in this case, I mean – that was, you know, uh, you know, a razor thin margin between success and failure. The the play was there. The guy still has to make a, a pretty good catch on yeah. uh, not an easy throw. There, there wasn't a lot of room there, you know, to play with. Uh, the defender was actually doing a decent job, and uh, you know, you had the sideline also as uh, as uh, border uh, that that was going to be prohibitive in trying to make that play, and they do it. I, I, I liked it. I was a little stunned though when you know because you're usually like such a sigh of relief that you got the. Tying touch. You tied it up. Yeah. You're going to, yeah. And you want to keep it going. But I, I, I like it. You know, sometimes you just have to kill the beast right now. 
And I, I guess that's the way Brian Kelly felt. And uh, he got rid of Alabama and two losses for old Nick. He, he's not used to explaining. Did you see him after the game? I mean, it looked like he found out that his daughter was in the hospital or something. Uh, you know, he, he had lost a quart of blood, I believe, between the time the game ended. <laughs> Yeah, it, it was pretty funny. I think one of the one of the quotes. I don't know if it was on. Does it, Twitter does it sound it like, on, by the way, uh, an ice cream truck is pulled up to the house? Yes. Can you guys hear this stupid alarm going off? Is that your house? I'm like, why are we playing classical music? I'm like, they know. I don't know it's why. Like, My phone, uh, you know, has got the sound on, and there's an alarm going. I thought you were waiting for me to order an Italian ice is there or something. <laughs> <laughs> You answer that question. I'll shut this thing off. Okay. Please, no, please. I, I, w- I would think Nick Saban. The first thing that he would have said was maybe. You know, it's probably time for a 12-team playoff. You know, yeah, this exactly. is the, if there's any ever going to be a time, this is the time. And I, I think exactly. that the NIL deal is a good thing. We should expand it you know, or something. <laughs> well, don't you think they will? I mean, uh, in season, they're going to make it. Team. In season, who's that guy? Yeah. Who, who's that guy? He's a real uh, hard ass, uh, Stanky or whatever. Sankey. Greg Sankey. Greg oh, Sankey. Greg Sankey. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Isn't he going to push? Uh, I mean, he, he's probably got more pull with the college football playoff system than uh, Bob Arum has with the World Boxing Association. Oh, yeah. I mean, in terms of, uh, you know, no, no, this guy's going to be number one. Uh, what do you think? I mean, it's going to be weird. And Clemson going down to Notre Dame, I could, could it get any better? I, I, yeah. I hate Notre Dame, but I hate Clemson more, I found out. Because well, I, I, I like this Freeman cat, and, and I like the fact that mm-hmm. his team got better, and, and this gets into what you implied about Mario Cristobal. Uh, how is it? Maybe Notre Dame has better personnel. That's possibly, uh, you know, uh, very much the truth. But they, they started so poorly and, and they incurred a couple of inexplicable, like uh, mind boggling losses. Marshall at home. But, but the last couple of weeks, I mean, they beat Syracuse and, and then uh, they go out there and, and knock off Clemson, who uh, seemed suspect all year. But, uh, you know, you still have to go and do it. And uh, I mean, they, they've gotten better during the course of the season under this guy's leadership. They have. And, you know, I haven't watched much of Notre Dame, but when you see the score and you go, oh, my gosh, that was a blowout, you know, yeah. because I, I don't think Clemson scored so late in the game. They dominated and, the game. They, they entire yeah. Block. So, yeah, you have to give credit, you know, to, to Freeman because that looked like a sinking ship in his first year. And, you know, the tenure of, of a head coach at Notre Dame usually lasts for a little while, but it didn't look like he was going to get much into his second season, which would be next year, if it continued this way. But now you rally, and you probably still have USC on the horizon. I, I'm not sure where they play because that's normally an end of end of scenario, end of end of year type of game. And you probably have one of the academies left uh, if you're Notre Dame. So um, yeah, good for them. Good for them. And and Clemson, I don't think I always felt like this year Clemson was a not a fraud. I don't want to say they're a bad team. They're not a bad team, but they weren't a top. They weren't a top three or four team to me, uh, just watching them play. They, they have deficiencies in terms of where they haven't had them in probably 10 years. Appalachian State, uh, I mean, that, that still plagues me that uh, you had the Canes in the category of maybe being the next Appalachian State. Maybe a, I, I, maybe that's a little lofty there, well, John. I mean, the, no, way that was a, the, the way I felt about it was yeah. I, I, Appalachian State's a really good team. Yeah, but people people underestimate what they have, right? What type of football that they play? My my thoughts of saying that was they were on par in terms of they shouldn't. Everybody, Miami fans, wow, we're we're the U, right? We're the U. We're, yeah. we're not the U. The, the U, that swagger and that that stuff is gone. Like yeah. you have to recreate what you are now. Like you have to start embracing the turnaround. Hopefully that Mario can can bring in and if they can challenge for an ACC title that's good that's okay but but the fan base has it to the point where they need to be the you no one ever that cycle's gone forever that's not coming back you're not going to replicate what what the University of Miami's done over the last you know in that 20 year span of of college football it's you just don't do it Look, and I'm not going to be a hypocrite because FSU lost by the same margin in year one of Mike Norvell's tenure to Miami. Now, right. there were some differences. Mike Norvell wasn't even there because he had COVID, so that affected it. It was on the road, which this was not. As much as it felt like an FSU home game, it was not an FSU home game. Uh, it was COVID, and the first-year coaches in COVID, some had some success, but a lot of them didn't. 
So those horses and Mike Norvell's making four million a year, where Cristobal's making eight, and Norvell's staff is among the moderately paid, where Cristobal staffs one of the higher paid staffs. So that's why, to me, where people want to say, well, Norvell struggled. See, you're not firing Mario Cristobal. But, and I say this, and we said that that year. Yeah, the FSU finished three and seven, but every game, they looked better. And by the right. end, the finished product looked vastly superior to the opening product. Right. We're doing this every week now, and every week, Miami looks worse. Like, not even a little worse. Like, they didn't, like, they went to the third string kid early just because they had no answers, and he did not look better. They, there was no point, no phase in their game where they, FSU demolished them on offense, defense, and special teams. But they've struggled on all parts at some points in this season. And you look at the end of the game, Travis threw 12 passes. Like, when does a quarterback not named Bob Greasy in a game in this day and age throw 12 passes and win by 40? Like, that's my problem with this whole thing is they're not getting better. And you can get better players and you can get – but you should at least been representative in that game. I mean, like, they were never in that game from the jump. And that's not the players. <laughs> that's the coaches. You know, it's funny, Luby, that you mentioned the 12 passes. I didn't realize he only threw it 12 times. I was flipping back and forth from the Alabama LSU game to the to the Miami game. And every time I, I watched the FSU offense, they were eight yards, seven yards. It's yeah, the same play. It's, ca- it's a counter play. Same counter play. And I'm saying to myself, I watched the first three defensive plays for UM. They came up the field and they had a tackle for loss. They, had, they caused some havoc in the backfield, but that was it. After the first three plays of the game, I don't think Miami spent any time in the FSU backfield disrupting anything. And it looked easy. Uh, and, and it felt like they were just they were just superior. It just felt like, you know, if you're recruiting the same type of player, boy, FSU really got the better end of, of that recruiting. So now you have to say, okay, well, Mario needs – a year or two of his guys to get into what their systems or what they're doing. Okay. I, I, I agree with that because they're down to their third string center or four string center. They're, yeah, they're, 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 they're offensive linemen's depleted, but you would still think defensively they should be better, right? They should not commit the same, you know, I think, I think, I don't know the, I don't know the guy's name, but zero for Miami. He has a personal foul. Every game I've watched every game I've watched, he, he should be on the sidelines. I mean, after the second one, you stand next to me until you can learn how not to do that again. And then when you do, we'll let you go back out and play. But for now, your, your spot's going to be up next to me. But there's no, there's no, rep, there's no, um, there's no kind of like deterrent there's no repercussions. For, for the same mistakes. And I, I just think that's, that's a coach killer. He's starting to look more and more exasperated after games. Uh, Mario Cristobal, uh, you know, at first, you know, all, all of the coach speak would lead you to, uh, you know, the kind of thing where, oh, we're going to fix these things and don't worry about it. We're going to come on strong. And I was like, well, I don't know. <laughs> He's going potentially. I said, yeah, sure. Yeah, no, yeah. Man. He's and, in the old business. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's easy to flip around though, uh, during that game. As, as much as I used to be yeah. riveted to every play of uh, UM too. FSU or UM Florida or FSU Florida, uh, because, I mean, it, it had to seem like uh, when, when you were out there with Tommy Fox playing for St. Thomas and, uh, you know, it, you had the, like the flying L's coming in on the bus <laughs> from about Fort Lauderdale. I mean, uh, you know, and you, you used to playing, uh, you know, the top team in Texas and then, you know, going out to California to beat Long Beach High School or whatever, you know, and, and then had a bunch of monsters on it. Um, you know, it, it looked like a complete mismatch. It, it really it did. It was. It was a mismatch. And it, it's sad to say, uh, but like I, every every time I switched back to the game, I, I was more and more uh, in disbelief that Miami could play like that in this type of game at home. And it wasn't, it wasn't competitive. So yeah, it was, it was definitely disappointing. And I don't know what, what they have left on their schedule. What are they four and five now, Luby, I think uh, as a team. Georgia Tech, so, Georgia Tech, who we know is not good. They're an underdog. No. In Georgia Tech. <laughs> wow. Not- yeah, that's, uh, that's pretty embarrassing. I, and for, and for FSU, Hey, let's give them credit. They took advantage of the situation. They were the better team, and they came down and, and they dominated. I mean, both sides of the offense and defensive lines were owned by the Seminoles, and they did what they were supposed to do. They're a good team. 
uh, I think, you know, the, it, they'd like to have a couple plays back in their season because it could, you know, definitely change the perspective and the trajectory of, of where, where they should be going. Yep. By the way, uh, nice job, uh, my fading Syracuse Orange. Oh, gosh. Your, uh, Pittsburgh team and, and FSU has uh, the Cuse on the schedule now that they're in a skid. You so, want to uh, you want to talk about watching paint dry? I watched a few plays of that. Game oh yeah, as well. I didn't see any of that. Uh, I was not involved there, so uh, so that was, that was probably uh, good on my part. All, all right, uh, the the cream is at the top there. Georgia easily handles Tennessee. Uh, how do you see the uh, you know rank and file in behind uh, as uh, Ohio State kind of struggle a little bit? People have them at number two. Michigan, uh, everybody was ragged on their schedule early in the season. They've acquitted themselves very well. Uh, in there at a solid number three. And, and TCU, who uh, many people thought were being ignored uh, because uh, they were undefeated and they were behind Alabama uh, in, in the rankings, now uh, in there at number four. Um, uh, what, what do you see? I mean, th- does that sustain itself, or uh, is that even possible with the uh, conference championship games that have to be played? I think TCU is going to be the wild card in this whole thing because Ohio State Michigan – uh, unless unless both of those teams, you know, get so much credit and it's a game that comes down to the last possession where, you know, you somehow uh, it's a field goal or it's a, it's a play that, you know, miraculous Toss up play. Game. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be one of those games. And you have Oregon and USC. Or, you know, Bo Nix is probably playing as good as anybody in the country at quarterback. And one of those teams – are going to, you know, or both of those teams are probably going to inch their way up or continue to climb the ladder to, you know, five, six, four, you know, somewhere in there. So that's going to have to iron itself out. And in the SEC, Georgia is probably the prohibitive favorite, right? That they're they're as good as anybody. Uh, I don't think anybody's close to what they're doing right now. So Ohio State in Michigan, you're going to get a, a winner there that goes to the Big Ten uh, title game. Uh, Oregon and USC are in a you know collision course out west. So TCU is kind of I think they're the team that I don't know much about, but every time I watch them, they're throwing it's a thirty yard touchdown strike or it's an eighty yeah. yard touchdown run. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so it, it's one of those teams I have to kind of pay more attention to. Or at least they're they're making you more attention to them. Find out because at the end of the at the end of the year, they may be one of the top four teams in the country. Just because Shredded of their wheat. schedule or who they're playing yeah. at the end. Big 12. I was going to say, USC defense shredded wheat, my friend. I mean, uh, they, they are just, as we like to say, they, they have more holes than an O.J. Simpson alibi. Uh, <laughs> and, and Oregon uh, looks like they've really uh, you yeah, know, tweaked it up. I mean, they're, they're a juggernaut offensively after that first game, yeah. uh, which you know it was an embarrassment, uh, I guess, against Georgia. They weren't ready to play. Uh, and, and, you know, a lot of people will make, uh, you know, a big deal out of it. Luby seems to be, you know, very favorable towards uh, working in the comment. Well, well, look at Oregon now without Mario and, and look at what's happening here. I mean, is there a little bit of uh, Bernie Madoff in this whole thing where, you know, the guy looks like he's an outstanding head coach. And yet, given a more difficult situation, I, I just think you should have better results. I mean, at least look better in the process of not That's being very good. That's my uh, that 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 that's troubling to me about uh, the way this coaching staff has performed so far with the Canes. I I don't know that you can just you know uh, excuse that away like we always do and go oh whoa, whoa they need time. They've had some time with this team and it's getting worse. They're not getting better. Yeah, yeah. I, I I think it's all about perspective when it comes down to to coaching and and college football because if you go back. Miami had every right to beat Texas A&M on the road. If the yeah. Canes catch the sure. football, they win the game. They may yeah. win the game by 10 points. If they just all, all they have to do is catch the football that night. They yeah. don't. Uh, everybody says now the quarterback's lost it. Well, the quarterback loses confidence. He gets banged up. Uh, he's playing on a team that he feels like, I- I'm doing what I can, and we're not getting any better. We're not getting the results. Then he has a down game, and everybody, you know it's his fault, so he gets yanked, right? And you have injuries up front on the offensive line. It's nobody's fault, but the backups aren't as good as the guys that were playing. And you mix in the fact that you change offensive philosophy, defensive philosophy, new coaches, new terminology, everything's brand new, and maybe you're not as good as the pundits say you are. You throw that in a bag and you mix it up, and it turns into what we have now at the U. 
A failure to communicate. That's what it is. Yeah. All right, uh, uh, Johnny, uh, Jimmy Johnson's big chill. We'll make the arrangements. Uh, we'll make the call. We'll, we'll pick a day. We'll, we'll try and all agree on one, and we'll just aggressively pursue this and hope that Jimmy's going to be there. How about that? Sounds good, guys. Can't wait. All right, and, and you have a great week. Uh, always you too. Terrific having you on the show. Thanks for uh, rearranging things. Uh, as uh, We have Billy Corbin coming up here, and he's got a whole new uh, documentary out. And uh, then, of course, uh, a wild array of opinions. So uh, we're looking forward to that as well here on the show. So stick with us. John, thanks so much for being with us. It's always a Thanks, pleasure. guys. Talk to you during the week, Luby. All thanks. right. John and Jimmy, ladies and gentlemen. That was fun. All right. Billy Corbin, uh, always a hoot. Uh, he's going to join us, uh, not visually, but uh, by a telephone here. And uh, that's coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, Billy, uh, no doubt, would be a big fan of Hialeah Park, right? Because as much as he might pick on the city of Hialeah. I am a guy. As a bastion of conservatism when it comes to politics, uh, he would love Hialeah Park as just a wild place to let go and have some fun. That's what it's all it's about. My, uh, the boxing's coming up there in February. That, that's a little ways down the road. A lot of special events. A great place to plan some time for the holidays, Luby. How about that? Get together with your friends, hoist a few, bet some ponies in the champion simulcasting room, play some poker, maybe try to make a score for the holidays. All of a sudden, uh, you know, never mind going to Macy's. I'm going to Cartier to get something for the wife. Uh, and, and you might be able to do that. I mean, we're waiting for this Powerball thing. What kind of Michigan stuff is that? You have zero chance to win. And, uh, yeah, you know, we're all sitting there saying, <laughs> well, I'm not worried about today's show because I'm going to be a billionaire in about an hour. It ain't happening. But uh, you have a chance to win jackpots galore in the casino at Hylia Park. They really know how to uh, make it friendly for the patrons. Get a player's card. The rewards program is spectacular. I know you get bombarded if you're a gambler. Uh, you get bombarded with rewards program uh, come-ons and things like that. I mean, just true blue, the stuff they give you, the amenities are uh, incomparable uh, with the rewards program at beautiful Hylia Park. And I would imagine, we'll keep you posted on this, but you can also check it out on our website there at HyliaPark.com. A any of the special events and uh, all kinds of uh, special opportunities they have during the holidays, right? Because they don't want you to be alone on Thanksgiving. They want you to come out there, have uh, your turkey dinner, and gamble your brains out. It's yeah. great. What could be better? I mean, uh, than people that know how to live. They have the spirit, the joie de vie. They know how to uh, make it so that it's going to be a festive holiday season. And a little extra Christmas money never hurt, right? So uh, all of a sudden, you bang one of those Royal Real Machines. And um, what are the two best words that you could group together in any casino situation? They'll be... Call attendant. <laughs> Not because your voucher got stuck. I was going to say. have to pay you a cash payoff right there All at the right. machine. Here's one, two, three. I love that when they do that, too. They have some video of that on their uh, Facebook page where, where, you know, guys are getting the, you know, like two dimes counted out. Fantastic, man. Well, what a great. There's no better feeling as a gambler than winning. It, it, it's just that that's what it's all about, right? It's Lombardi. Winning isn't everything. And it certainly isn't the only thing, but, uh, you know, you would like it to be. That, that's for sure. You're going to feel like a winner. That's the message here at beautiful Hylia Park. All right, coming right back with Billy Corbin, uh, famed and esteemed uh, documentary filmmaker, raconteur uh, productions. And he's got a new thing in the hopper there about this uh, whole, whole business with the Falwells, right? Where she's tapping the pool guy and uh, then uh, he wants to watch. I mean, it, it's kind of crazy. So uh, we'll get the scoop on that. God forbid on Hulu, and it's out now. Billy Corbin, who uh, put that whole thing together, is going to join us here in just a few moments. Now that. The time. I only wish Billy was a little more opinionated. Yeah, you know? sort of mild. Like as a talk show guest, you want a guy, you don't want Troy Aikman. Well, that might be a. a <laughs> but then again, it might not. Okay. If he would just be a little opinionated. Nice. It's uh, 821. Ponies in style at Champions, the outstanding simulcasting room at beautiful Hylia Park. Yes, the grand old lady of thoroughbred racing has never been more vibrant, and you can wager on the races from the top tracks around the country while enjoying a cocktail at the Brass Rail Bar or any of the fine food served throughout the facility. If poker is your game, you're covered in style, and you can play all your favorite Vegas-style games, including blackjack, craps, and roulette in Hylia Park's sizzling hot casino. Get a player's card when you walk through the door for all kinds of generous amenities, including our favorite, free play. When you come out to the ultimate casino and entertainment destination, highly a park. Hey folks, Tony Segretto here. You know, since day one, Catholic Health Services has been part of old school. And since we've started letting people know about them, it's changed their lives. You see, Catholic Health Services, while being recognized as one of the top places for stroke rehab in the country, it's also about a group of people who not just excel in what they do, 
from the doctors to the nurses to the therapist, on and on and on. It's how they do what they do every single day that separates them from the pack. They do it with a passion, unmatched, and the inclusion of family in every step of the process. Trust me when I tell you this. If you want the best unmatched rehab with a special group of skilled, caring people, there is truly only one place, and that one place is Catholic Health Services. These days, we're all looking for comfort anywhere we can find it. Thank goodness for Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill in the plantation location because they are making sure you are as comfortable as possible. First of all, they're not only open for delivery and pickup. All you have to do is go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both pickup and free delivery. Their hours have changed a little bit. Monday through Thursday from 3.30 to 10. And Friday, Saturday, and Sunday from 11.30 to 10. You're going to have the best wings in the world. You're going to have a great burger. You're going to have... They're amazing soups. Again, Landlubbers, Raw Bar and Grill. It's nice and easy. Just go to landlubbersbarandgrill.com for both your pickup and free delivery. Thank goodness for Landlubbers for making you always feel right at home. The great Billy Corbin joins us here on the show. Always great having you on the show. But holy Donna Shalala, what is going on in, in Miami-Dade County right now? Well, I'm not too humble to admit it. I just don't know who would actually say that. <laughs> what is going on in Miami-Dade County right now? What is ever going on in Miami-Dade County? I mean, I think it's a that is an evergreen question. What the hell is going on? Nothing good. I think everybody with a half a brain, so that doesn't include any of our mayors, uh, knew <laughs> that uh, everyone everyone with half a brain knew that reopening was a bad idea. That it was happening too soon. Um, that it was going to have a devastating effect, and, and all of those people were mayors were wrong. Uh, that includes the county mayor, that includes not all, but many of the city mayors. You know, we have 34 municipalities uh, in Miami Dade, um, and, and each one knows less the hell is going on uh, than, than the one before them. That includes uh, the empty suit, Francis Suarez. Um, who bizarrely is, is always getting interviewed on television, but under the charter of the city has virtually no power. Okay, the guy's like a hood ornament. I mean, he doesn't, I mean, as far as the, he, you know what he is? Uh, Francis Suarez is a mascot in the head coach's office for some reason. You know, and, and, like, I, I don't even understand the, the position under charter has no power. The best way to kick off your day is with Defo plus Luby. We now return to the Defo show. Welcome back to the show, the uh, Depot Show here at South Florida Live. Jeff DeForest and uh, the bespeckled Mike Luby Lubitz, which uh, I'm still having trouble uh, recognizing you with those glasses on. Uh, Twelve years I know this kid. I didn't even know he wore contact lenses. Unbelievable. Shows you how much I care about the producer. <laughs> Slash co-host. Sorry, Luby. I didn't mean to not put you in the credits there. All right, here's a guy that deserves a lot of credit. I, I guess we should welcome him in uh, with song, right? Donna Shalala. Down by the shore, Donna Shalala. She don't work here no more, Donna Shalala. Shalala. What do you think, Billy Corbin? Filmmaker, extraordinaire, documentary man, man of the new movie out there on Hulu, uh, God forbid. I don't know if I, uh, I, don't know if I trust uh, Luby with glasses. It's like uh, when Dwight Waterdale shaved his mustache off. I never, never quite look at him the same way again, you know? <laughs> I understand what you're saying. I, I really do. I, I get the connection there. It's kind of like a mascot in the coach's office. Uh, you know, it's interesting. That clip was from two years ago, and, and it's very much applicable today. <laughs> mascot in the coach's office. But uh, but enough about the Miami Hurricanes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You don't want to uh, go there, do you? I mean, how, how do you explain the inexplicable, I guess? Uh, are, are you calling for the return of Manny Diaz at this point? <laughs> Listen, I, I in any capacity, in any capacity, yeah. Manny Manny Diaz Senior is doing to the uh, the Florida Democrats what Man, Manny Diaz Junior did to the Miami Hurricanes. So no, I'm not calling for the return. I'm not calling for the return of any of the Miami, Manny Diazes. We only had so many stadiums we can knock down. Um, and I'm also just giving uh, I'm also just giving Mario a hard time, who I who I think is going to turn the thing around. I think obviously he's. Uh, Needs a couple seasons to get the act together. All right. Uh, how many years are we going to set the clocks back today in terms of American history, Billy Corbin? What do you think? Because uh, I'm futilely going to cast my uh, vote on the uh, Democratic line there. And uh, 
I, I have a feeling it would be just as useful for them to take my ballot and instead of putting it through the machine, just throw it in the intercoastal. I mean, uh, what, what, what do you think? I mean, is there any shot that, that uh, we can well, survive this, uh, this day today and not go back to the Stone Age? When people have a conversation about how fragile our democracy is, you have to, you have to realize how young it is. Yeah. And, and anybody who says that our democracy started in 1776 uh, doesn't know what they're talking about. Our democracy started in 1965 yep. um, and, and with the Voting Rights Act. And so uh, when, when people were able to participate in that democracy. So when you consider how young it is, that's how easy it is to turn the clock uh, backwards. You don't need a DeLorean with a flux capacitor, you know, to go back <laughs> uh, you know, 60, 60, 70 years uh, in, in a single election. It's crazy. Billy Corbin with us here. Now, now we have a new film out. How, how's it being received? It came out, uh, what, the other day on Hulu? God forbid. I, I love, uh, I mean, the scenario is right out of my uh, life uh, where, you know, you, your wife is tapping the pool guy and you, you want to, you know, get a popcorn and watch. Uh, God forbid uh, the story of the uh, Falwells and the sex scandal that brought down, uh, I mean, j- just an absolute monster uh, of, uh, you know, a, a corporation when it comes to uh, worshiping God. Um Tell us about the uh, film and and, uh, and and how you uh, came about doing it. Yeah, first and foremost, it is about the sex scandal that brought down this this fifty year uh, evangelical dynasty. Uh, of course, there's a Miami connection because there's always yes a Miami connection. <laughs> this um, happened at the Fountain Blue. Was it the Fountain case, Blue pool guy? Yes, a uh, young guy, Giancarlo Granda, was putting himself through school at FIU. Uh, working for a year as a pool attendant at the Fountain Blue. Oh, okay, it was. Yeah, yeah, the peak of its of its yeah. Vegas like yeah. insanity yeah. Uh, at that pool scene. Yeah. Sure. And uh, he's doing his thing, and he and he meets a woman who he describes as a cougar, um, who propositioned him, saying, "You know, after work, you want to come back to my hotel room." Um, there's just one thing, the way Giancarlo. Uh, tells it is that she said, my husband likes to watch. And <laughs> he said, well, I'm, he said, he, he says in the documentary, well, I'm a horny 20 year old. I'm down, whatever. Yeah. Um, <laughs> his older sister is trying to talk him out of it, mm. but he's like, oh, whatever. This is an adventure, right? I'm, I mean, he's a Miami kid uh, living his best life. And this couple seems to be, you know, vacationing in Miami, living their best life. But what's kind of interesting is that it turns out that this couple is Jerry Falwell Jr. and his wife Becky, who it was, they were at the time, I should say, the president and first lady of Liberty, the largest Christian university in the world. Mm. Um, and so they were kind of down here on the down low, you know, living, uh, li- living the dream. Kind of interesting. All right. Now, now um, who's involved? Because you always uh, get a zillion interviews in these documentaries, and it's fascinating as you go back and forth with the different characters as they tell the story. And then I don't know where you dig up these video clips. Uh, do you have any actual clips of this activity? <laughs> that must have been a little hard to come by. Well, there, there, are, some, there are some clips that will, uh, that will surprise you. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. I mean, we interview the pool attendant, his sister, we interview, um, you know, some of the other people involved in the controversy as the story unfolded, including the journalist who who broke the story. Um, and uh, what what happened is that we put Giancarlo to the ringer. I mean, like, you know, it wasn't enough to take his word for it. You know, we demanded corroboration for everything. And so oh, wow. we spent months and months and months digging up, te- you know, copious amounts of text messages, some of which you see in the doc, but only a tiny fraction of them do we use, but we needed them to, you know, to confirm, uh, you know, his version of the events. And we have emails and we have photos. And yes, we do have, have some video um, that we use and very, <laughs> yes, excerpt it because of its, you know, sensitive uh, nature, if you will. And so, uh, but you, you know, we do, we do use it just simply enough to, again, to prove uh, uh, or, or establish the facts as he as he presents them, and and it's a very compelling story because it's not just about this sex scandal, um, which in and of itself is a yeah is a good story, but it's really the story of this fifty year evangelical dynasty that had outsized influence on presidential politics. A very apropos for election day. 
I mean, you're always on target here. Uh, how would you characterize uh, the tone of the response for a request for uh, interviews or to get uh, on the record uh, statements from the Falwells? Well, they're not talking. Um, <laughs> the, the, his, his tenure, uh, terse his email? Uh, what would you say? Yeah, no. He, he, he's, he's, he's in the corner right now watching me, Depot. Um, <laughs> uh, uh, he's probably monitoring every he, word of this interview, well, I, I would imagine, uh, with lawsuits on his mind, no? Well, his, his, his tenure at Liberty University ended acrimoniously, shall yeah. we say. Um, and they are they are all tied up in a in a forty million dollar lawsuit. They are suing each other. You know, Liberty suing him. He's counter suing Liberty. It's just a great big mess. Uh, and so, um, what he has told, uh, what um, he we sent him a list of questions. He and Becky threw the reply back, basically thanks but no thanks. Um, and then yeah, I would imagine um, he's they've been telling the press. Lately, that that they they're not speaking on advice of counsel because of this ongoing litigation. There you go. Makes perfect sense. Uh, all right, uh, and I would imagine the response uh, has been fantastic. Uh, as Joel Osteen complimented you <laughs> on uh, even entering into this project. Well, I, it's it's been an interesting experience. Obviously, it's a bit of a roar shark, you know, because everybody comes to a documentary with their own experience, their own baggage. Obviously you, you know, having, having worked as a pool boy in a cuckold threesome, you have a different experience to people that you bring. That you I didn't see any problem people, with it. You know? really so, <laughs> yeah. Listen, nobody wants to kink shame these folks. I think, you know, come to Miami, come to Miami, live, yeah. you know, live the Miami dream, avail yourself amenities, you know, go to, the swingers clubs, you know, go to the nightclubs, have, uh, you know, safe sex with consenting adults. I, I think the story here, of course, is this holier than thou yep. hypocrisy of how they w ran this, this Christian institution with an iron fist and punished, yep. punished students for taking part in exactly the same kind of behavior that they were, you know, that they were taking part of and, uh, you know, down here in, um, in Miami and also in New York and also in Virginia and also in the Keys. And they were, they got around, <laughs> they got around <laughs> a bit with the, uh, with Giancarlo. Um, and so I, I think that's the, that's the really compelling part of the story. And that's what people are mostly taking to, but everybody, you know, Jerry Falwell Jr. was the first evangelical leader to endorse Donald Trump, who was a twice divorced, you know, New York Democrat playboy with five children from three different mothers and did very much did not seem like the, the you know archetype of an evangelical candidate, and he made yeah. it okay for other evangelical leaders to endorse him. And, and Donald Trump wound up getting a record eighty one percent of evangelical voters in twenty sixteen. So definitely helped him get elected. So part of that there are some inconvenient truths, shall we say, in that part of the storyline that some people are not uh, 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 are pissed about. I mean, the political wherewithal, uh, the power that uh, was wielded by Jerry Falwell, uh, you know, seemed pretty incredible. Uh, you know, in, in your experience, I, I guess, in, in doing research, has there ever been uh, a TV evangelist move, movement that, that didn't end in some form of shame or disgrace? Yeah, exactly. uh, is there anybody yeah, in that business that's on a level, in your opinion, Billy Corbin? Anybody? Uh, well, listen, I, I, I mean, I, I, it's a good point because I, I see that you know, this documentary is not about Christians or, or Christianity. This documentary is about people who exploit Christians and yep. Christianity for power and profit. And I think those are the types of characters that you're talking about. There is a difference between Christians and televangelists. There's a difference between Christians and Christian nationalists, you know? And, and so the idea of conflating those is where it gets messy and unfair to, to real to real Christians. But what's incredible, though, about and what you just asked is that today, as we sit here and speak, we could turn on the television and we could see Jimmy Swaggart yeah. preaching. Yeah. We could yeah. see Jim Baker and his new wife preaching. So there's only, there always seems to be a third and fourth and fifth act for these guys. <laughs> as long as they cry yeah. on TV yeah. and beg yeah. forgiveness, they're right back out there uh, taking people's money again. Well, Corbin, man, and look, I want to take it back to the election, and, and I'm super stoked about your film. It's Defoe's underplaying it. Like, I've seen it everywhere, nationally, locally, all over all the social media platforms. This is the film that people are looking at right now. And 
It's because of today. Like it, you talked to MSNBC and I quoted you, retweeted you, talked about what today is and what this film sort of brings out. And that's why I wanted to have you on. I love talking to you about election because you and with your podcast, because Miami stuff you do with Levitard, where you come straight out and bring out the Miami stuff. And that's why people go to your social media stuff. What are you looking for from today with the election? Is it Defoe has gone on the negative and a lot of people have it. Is there any hope for saving quote unquote America? Well, there's no hope in Florida. Um, Florida <laughs> is a lost cause. Um, <laughs> There's no doubt about that. Florida, Florida is a lost cause. You know, the Democrats have been a non-entity in this state for 22 years. I think DeSantis is going to win Miami-Dade County, which is which is uh, a pretty unfounded. historic. Yeah, um, the Democrats basically waved the white flag. They effectively gave up on Florida for whatever reason. I think that's a mistake. But listen, the Republicans need Florida to win a national election. The Democrats don't. Yeah. So maybe that was the calculus. If there was a calculus, it doesn't really seem like there was, it seems more of just like, you know, death by neglect, uh, yeah. just, just uh, malpractice, I would say, politically speaking. But um, nationwide, I think it's a lot closer than, in, I mean, frighteningly closer in a, lot of, in a lot of states and a lot of races, more so than certainly than the fake polls would have you believe and, and that uh, the gloom and doom of the press. The bottom line is, is that, you know, just vote, you yeah. know, whoever you're going to vote for, go out and vote. It doesn't matter what you, you, you hear about the polls or what political narratives or storylines uh, are out there in the press, just go and vote. And that's, that's, how people, that's how people win. I think what's particularly treacherous about these times is not only the rise in right-wing political violence uh, that we've seen in recent years, but also the election denial. Yeah. Um, that's treacherous because that's what the Republicans have been setting up, this idea that if we win, it's legit. And if we lose... Then it was rigged, and obviously that's pure nonsense. And and they're also setting up scenarios in which, you know, certain states or cities or counties uh, have to, um, you know, count votes in a way that are more favorable to the Republicans early, and then you know, like for example, in-person votes, and then later count the um, the mail-in ballots or the vote-by-mail ballots, which which are you which usually favor Democrats, yeah. which then gives the idea that. The early, you know, the, the, Dem the Republicans are in the lead and then the Democrats, quote unquote, take it or steal it. Um, and of course, also, it, it delays the, the counting and the results in a way that they can start claiming victory early and then painting it uh, as if, oh, the longer this process goes on, uh, the more likely it is it's, that something nefarious is happening. When in actuality, what's happening is the votes are being counted. So count every legal vote and find out who won, no matter how long it takes. That's democracy. That wasn't you in a MAGA hat uh, at that rally uh, for uh, Marco Rubio <laughs> down, down at the uh, fairgrounds in Miami, was it, with uh, Donnie Boy pulling in there? <laughs> what was the likelihood that you were in attendance there unless you were filming something, uh, you know? Uh, you know, this, the selective uh, memory also is kind of fascinating to me where, uh, you know, you have a guy in Ron DeSantis that by all rights should be brought up on criminal charges for misappropriation of state funds with that yep. stunt he did with yep. the Venezuelans. And, and then you're seeing Venezuelans for DeSantis uh, <laughs> in, in uh, Miami where, where, I mean, he, he just uh, committed, uh, you know, uh, a humanity atrocity towards these people. And yet they're in favor of him. Uh, you know, we said earlier in the show when we were uh, – you know, saying and promoting that you were going to be on, Billy, uh, that, uh, you know, people in Miami, and this came from my friend, a poly man, who, who you've heard on the radio many times. Uh, he, he said that in Miami, uh, by the bed, they have a picture of Jeb Bush and Mother Teresa. Those are the two pictures. And, you know, it was only a matter of time before, uh, you know, these people that, that immigrated here from uh, different countries and, and now are citizens and have the right to vote. How on earth did they uh, turn into, uh, you know, uh, right wing Republicans uh, when it seems like that would be the last yep. uh, agenda they would want to support? Yeah, I mean, this attitude of, you know, close the door behind me or pull up the ladder. <laughs> yeah, behind me is, is a, it's crazy. Yeah, it, 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 it seems it seems counterintuitive, you know, it, yeah. it, effectively immigrants who would vote to deport themselves yes. uh, is, what, yeah. is what you have. And it's, and it's, yeah. that's a peculiar uh, dynamic, but I think you have to realize that, that culturally there is not a tradition of democracy in the countries from which they originate. Yeah. You know, there might be a, a culture of religiosity or Catholicism. There's certainly a culture of dictatorships. 
Um, you know, there's certainly a culture of political violence, but there isn't really a culture of democracy. So the idea of coming to a new country and embracing a strongman or embracing, you know, fascism or a dictatorship, it's like, because most of these countries are not even communist or socialist countries. They <laughs> are simply fascist. dictatorships, yep. you know, and that's, and so there is that propensity to say, here's a, especially like these phony strong men too, like, 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 you know, who, who's, a, who's, a, who's the strong man? A guy that gets up and makes the longest speeches, you know, like, I don't really, I don't really understand the appeal, but, but there is that appeal. And, and it's not just, you know, our, our friends from South America, it's, it's people all over the country are embracing that because they feel that the, that white men are being oppressed in, in America <laughs> because, because more, and, and, and by the That's way, funny. when more Americans have more rights, that makes government smaller and less powerful. Yeah. So that's a conservative value, right? Is small government. And if you give more Americans more rights, power to the people, that's how you create, uh, you know, that's how you really make small government. All right, final thing. Uh, will you be my neighbor? Uh, I, I've been scanning uh, beach houses in Costa Rica. They go for like one fifty to 300000 And uh, did you foresee <laughs> that in the future? I mean, is it... Uh, if the Trumpster runs again and wins, I mean, uh, would it be time for Billy Corbin, red-blooded American and a uh, serious advocate for everything about South Florida, having obviously a great run of success here well, with uh, all of the uh, different films you're doing and being in hot demand. Will you be my neighbor in Costa Rica circa 2024? Well, the funny thing about it is, is, is that as white men, if we flee the country, we are arguably help make America more diverse. <laughs> which is not what which is, I guess I got to stick around. Yeah, what they want to do, they want to they they want to run out the people of color and the yeah, immigrants yeah, and the, yeah. But but I think it's funnier if we go and then America becomes you know uh, yeah. uh, uh, a a yeah. more a more diverse and colorful country, which is exactly the way it's going, and it's exactly what they're afraid of. I mean, but you have to embrace that change. You have to embrace the message of of the Statue of Liberty. That's how that's how all of us got here. We're all tourists. You know, because yeah. the founding fathers yes. came and, and took this land from the Native Americans. You know, this was, you know, we're, we're all just on, on borrowed time on rented land here. Sure. Uh, final thing, too, you know, just uh, an aside. Uh, have you ever seen uh, Marco Rubio and the sportscaster from uh, Channel 10, Will Manso, in the same place at the same time? Are they not <laughs> one and the same? <laughs> That's a, really, I, I, that's a that's really if I ever need to do reenactments of, in one of my documentaries yeah. of Marco Rubio at is Alice that, Wainwright that Park, I will hire Will Manso. Yeah, that's exactly. a really good idea. If you're not playing Rubio, yes, I mean, will 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 take your shirt off and get in that foam over there. We're doing uh, <laughs> we're we're, we're, we're a ballroom circa 1994, uh, and you are Marco. Uh, here's some glow sticks. Go make it go you know, dance. Uh, God, uh, God forbidden, right? God forbid. That's the name of the uh, film. Uh, check it out on uh, Hulu. And uh, <laughs> is it available on other sources or uh, uh, just uh, punch up Hulu and you've got no, this it's thing? Only streaming, only streaming on the Hulu machine. Okay. Good. All right. Very good. Rave reviews uh, as always. Yes. Uh, all of your work. I mean, uh, the, the fascinating. I, I, who does your research on these clips that you dig up? I mean, even going back to Cocaine Cowboys, j just amazing, right? Well, you get like a young Tony Segreto. Who is still in a sports department, and and he's uh, <laughs> he's uh, you know uh, chasing you know some drug dealer at the airport in uh, in Colombia, and you're thinking how is that how is that possible? Right to Tony's, we were right to Tony's family and got his bar mitzvah video. <laughs> We'll get to Kyrie at another time. Yeah, Billy, right. always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for sharing time with us. It's absolutely fantastic. Appreciate it. Thanks for having me, guys. We'll All right, Billy Corbin. Man, that guy is in hot demand. Uh, you know, how, how many different it's things everywhere. has he come out with? On MSNBC, because it's one of his projects. Go to the different genres. He'll, you'll see him ESPN. You'll see him on all the sports. Well, this is more political. So he's been on MSNBC, CNN. I don't know if he's on Fox, but he's been on no, all I wouldn't imagine. platforms. Yeah. I mean, it, it, and it, it comes out the right time. It's very, uh, I don't know about election based, but political. Like that's it, a he's right. Yeah, it's, it's true. Like I mean, 
Very blue. Uh, you know, they're, they're supposed to be in a separation of church and state, right? But the Falwell was highly influential. A hundred percent. The original, the, the, the uh, Jerry Falwell himself was in the pockets right, so, of, of presidents, Democrat and Republican. I don't want to cast Shirley into this role here because you guys are too happy together and everything's going great. And I'm very happy for you, Lou, because I know you were miserable there for a period of time uh, after uh, the previous thing didn't work out so well. Uh -huh. Whereas most guys are in celebration for that period of time. In fact, <laughs> it becomes the highest point of their sexual activity of their lifetime is between marriages. No, well, I mean I, that was that was the case with me. Last breakup, I, I, you, well, you were there for that when you saw me. Oh, really God, you were wild. that was that after, was after my first real big breakup. The marriage. I was so proud of you. I was so I, proud I, of you, Libby. No, you were. I, I was at a different point in my life where I was ready to actually be settled down, and I didn't want to not. When, when that old station wagon was shaking, <laughs> and, and it was the only car in the drive through area there at the Ocean Manor Hotel after we had done a show at the Bamboo Beach Tiki Bar, and even Frank Tallarico came out, the owner, and said, I love it, man. That would be something else. <laughs> oh, God. And we knew you were banging that chicken area. It was fantastic. <laughs> And you just met her. That that was the thing. And other guys were eyeballing the same woman. Uh, she had a certain uh, inherent appeal where you were thinking, uh, yeah, not bad over there on table two. Right? Which is, I mean, what else are you concentrating on during a show? Everybody knows that, right? Women. Especially in a place like that. <laughs> the women. <laughs> Imagine when, when those uh, Kentucky co-eds were naked on the bar there and uh, people were uh, having jello shots off their belly buttons. All right. So maybe it reeks of being a little bit of a dirty old man even at your age. But uh, it wasn't so, then. certainly at mine, it lacks a, an element of dignity. <laughs> but that's what I was thinking about. I was saying, yeah, you know, the dolphin should have gone for that third down. <laughs> What's really going on in your mind? That's the question. There you go. The way to the All right, uh, Billy's great. Now, is that going to be on uh, Five Reasons today? You're going to pop that on there? Are we still doing it? Uh, probably. Be, yeah, we are still doing it, obviously. But okay, um, that it'd probably be a lot more of uh, We talked a lot of dolphins. We talked a lot of canes and. I always like Jimmy's takes on both the Dolphins and the Kings. Pretty honest. John was brilliant today, man. He really was. He was great. Uh, you know, so many things happening. And, uh, you know, college basketball started yesterday. Yes, the which Kings did then, which was good. The Moles were I, good. I have to admit, I, I, don't, I don't get as deeply into it uh, anymore like I used to uh, until sort of around the February, end of the regular season maybe. And, and, you know, certain games naturally stand out. You want to see them when you see one versus two or whatever. Yeah. And, and they're, you know, into December. I, I like the early season holiday tournaments because good teams play each other because they don't yep. mind a, a loss isn't nearly as costly in college basketball, especially against a quality opponent. So that's kind of a nice aspect of it. Although it was Cupcake City. It's funny, too, because when I yeah. glanced – I was glancing at the odds, of course. It's the first thing I turn to in uh, my New York Post every day, which, by the way, they're back on target with the delivery. Haven't uh, nice. really had any incidents lately. Uh, since that, The guy must have gone out of town for a couple of days and let his brother-in-law do it or something, you know? Yeah, yeah. The substitute, it's like a substitute teacher. It just uh, it leads itself to Armageddon like chaos. Uh, unbelievable. So uh, I'm looking at I thought I was looking at college football odds, and I'm saying, who, who are these cupcake teams that these uh, powerhouses are playing, right? <laughs> Like Michigan's playing Fort Wayne or whatever. And, I mean, it, it was incredible. And then I realized, wow, okay, it's college basketball. So uh, people are already drawing conclusions based on uh, these uh, mismatches that took place uh, on the opening night of the season and, and saying uh, they're already anointing Kentucky as the number one team in the country. Their big guy, what, what's his name, Schwebe or something? I don't know. What's that guy's name? You know more than me. I know they had got they're back to getting ridiculous. He's good. No, that guy's a monster. He, he's a good player. Uh, he didn't play last night, and, and it won by fifty, so uh, or something like that. And, and you know, I'm, I'm spanning some, you know, scanning some stuff online, and uh, of course they've already got it. Well, yeah, there you go. Kentucky demonstrates they're number one. <laughs> they, they played like uh, literally, like uh, you know, uh, a uh, a prep school. <laughs> uh, yeah, they did. Yeah, it was bad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, uh, yeah, they, these were guys. I, I don't know. They might have even played like a prison team. I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> it's like they played the guards from the local penitentiary. Unbelievable. But uh, they blew them out. So uh, that was good. Good start to the uh, season. Oh, Howard. Uh, a bunch of stuff, too. I, I mean, did, did you see this, too? I, I guess uh, last night you had Edmonton going against the Capitals. Okay. And it was McDavid and Ovechkin, I think, uh, yes. on the ice at the Ovechkin is, uh, you know, uh, zeroing in on some, some incredible records, and, and he's surpassed some already. And, and as Connor McDavid, 
who would ever think, like, wow, I have to get Edmonton tickets if they were coming to town? Be one of the last teams you considered. Maybe what? The Calgary Flames? Do they still have a team in Vancouver? Yeah, yes, they do. Who they even knows, right? I don't know. I mean, these Western teams are fairly invisible to uh, hockey fans on the East Coast. But this Connor McDavid is definitely worth the price of admission. I, I saw a stat. He, he had played 500 games. I think he played in his 500th game now, Connor McDavid. And in those 500 games, he's already accu- accumulated, uh, I think, just short of 750 points. Wow. Jesus. I mean, uh, that's that's got to be one of the all-time uh, ratios, if not number one. Yep. Uh, you know, and, and I don't always like when they quantify everything. Well, he's uh, the youngest guy ever to do this uh, that's under the age of 22 years, three months, and seven days. It's like, okay, so how many guys fit the category? I don't know. Exactly. I guess everybody does at some point, but... Uh, this uh, is a phenomenal ratio, isn't it? I mean, uh, 500 games, and I think it might have been, I don't remember the exact number. It was like 740-something in terms of uh, overall points. Now, that's goals and assists, but wow. Still, so, all around then. Would yeah. you pay to see this guy? I mean, I kind of yeah. always like it when Ovechkin's on the ice. He, he had a pass in last night's uh, game. That was so incredible, Luby. Uh, I don't know why it wasn't the number one play on SportsCenter, where he's on the right side of the goal, uh, right, right around the uh, net, and there were like two guys on him, and he passes the puck uh, blindsided between his legs and, and happens to uh, put it right on the stick of a guy who's charging to the net, and he puts it in for the goal. Pretty incredible play. I mean, John Stockton-esque. It, it was, and you're thinking, this guy's on skates while he's getting this snot knocked out of him by two guys. I mean, Novechkin, nobody's immune in the NHL. He, he has like three teeth also. It's incredible, right? It's like they took some guy out of a fire in Calabasas and said, uh, you know, here, here's one of the poor homeowners. They're like, don't people have teeth there? Are there no dentists in that part of California? Well, they are kind of mountain men. All right, we're coming back with more in a moment here uh, on the uh, Depot Show. We'll wrap things up. Went by very quickly here today. And uh, right after, I guess 1 o'clock, Luby, is when I make the beeline over there to uh, the uh, Sumption oh. Church. Please go vote. Don't. No, no I, I, I'm definitely in on not that. you. I, I, I know you're yeah. going to vote. I'm saying whoever's yeah. watching us now or later, please go vote. Please. Don't worry about Be- polls. Don't worry about this and that. Get your vote. You're here. You're in Well, you never know, right? Have for now. Yeah, yeah. Who knows how long we'll end. have it. So while we have the right to freely vote and it's easily accessible, go do but it. But it, it's, it's Lou Duva time, man. I mean, uh, we're throwing in a towel, I think, on the guys that I'm voting for. Uh, and I, I didn't, uh, of course, I procrastinated to the point where I never did the research on the judges. So uh, what kind of hypocrite am I, Luby? Did you vote for the complete overthrow of the Florida Supreme Court? I always I vo- do. I vote for that annually. I just want all of them out. Yeah, I figure they're all right wing. I mean, just, uh, you know, we're sitting there uh, ready to, uh, you, know, uh, re- you know, go ahead and, and restrict even more the uh rights of the poor people that we fought for for so many years. Uh, all right. Uh, we're coming back with more in a moment. Now that. It's 855. Folks, Tony Segreto here. Let me ask you a question. What do you look for when you go out to eat? Good food, obviously. Friendly atmosphere, not too loud, but good energy, reasonable prices, and a place where you feel comfortable. All those ingredients, (laughs) no pun meant there, are hard to find unless you're talking about the Texas Roadhouse. You see, they encompass all of those attributes. Really, really good food. Amazing atmosphere. Good for a family. Good for a date or just a night out for yourself. And prices that will make you extremely happy. Their ribs unmatched. Steaks hand cut every day. Everything, and I mean everything, is made on site, including their incredible bread. It's the one day, folks, that you can forget about low-carb diets. Trust me when I tell you, Texas Roadhouse, your restaurant, your destination, when you say, where should we go and eat tonight? From the newly renovated sports bar to the beautiful bayside views captured at the Tiki Bar, Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill has it all. Located at mile marker 104, the Big Chill also offers waterfront dining while experiencing breathtaking sunset views of the Florida Keys. It's simply the hottest spot in the Keys to cool off. That's Jimmy Johnson's Big Chill at mile marker 104 in Key Largo. For more information, call today at 305-453-9066. To be or not to be, that is the question. Whether it is nobler in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against a sea of troubles, and by opposing end them, to die, to sleep, no more, and by asleep, to say we end the heartache and a thousand natural shocks. What could that have been about, except to hedge or not to hedge? The modern-day odd couple, Defoe and Louie, are on now. 
It is, of course, The Depot Show. Friends, Romans, countrymen, or as Larry King would uh, have added to that line, loan me $50. That'd be the way to go. <laughs> All right, Louis. Uh, our fate, uh, I fear, and this is a line from uh, a King Crimson song. Uh, was their original album? Uh, I want to say came out circa nineteen seventy, maybe. King Crimson, uh, a twenty first century schizoid man, uh, and then uh, on that uh, album, uh, which I think was brilliant, uh, it was one of the original uh, albums with synthesizers uh, and Robert Fripp uh, was the guy that was behind it. They had the greatest album cover ever. The uh, King Crimson album. Did we ever put that up? Uh, you were worried about some kind of rights violation. I put picture up. I mean, is that face I not uh, indicative of what people should be feeling today? The face on that King Crimson album, absolutely uh, tremendous uh, piece of artwork, and uh, indicative of the kind of music that it was. And uh, there, there's a song called Epitaph on that album, and one of the lines in the song, uh, I may be paraphrasing a little bit here, but uh, I think it's close is uh, our fate, I fear, is in the hands of fools. And that's that's pretty much where we're at right now, no? I mean, yeah. uh, Herschel Walker looks like he might get elected. Which makes it, I mean, I, whatever. I mean. It's scary, right? This uh, Stoneman, whatever her name is. Uh, oh, MTG. What was it, Marjorie Green or whatever? Marjorie yeah. Taylor Green. Taylor Green, yeah. Stoneman we literally Douglas, just spews theories about. that are not based in reality at all. Um, spews prejudice. Carrie Lake, I mean, another frightening one out there running for governor of uh, Arizona. Oh, no, well, yeah, is she running Maria for Senate? Go, so, governor. Elvira, Maria Elvira, whatever her name is, is a total. Dr. Movie. Oz, I mean, yeah, they're, talk they're, about uh, Dr. Frankenstein. I mean, uh, here's Oprah created this guy, yes. right? Who would have ever thought of this, uh, you know, guy, Dr. Oz? Who the hell is he? Wow, and wow. Uh, she put him on a map and then denounced him, right? They said, hey, if you do anything, don't vote for this clown. He's a charlatan. Yeah. Tell you, doesn't even live in a the state there, right? No. He was never. He never had anything to do. He hadn't even had a cheesesteak. This guy. <laughs> All of a sudden, he's Mister Pennsylvania, right? Like he, uh, you know, was uh, the reincarnation of Papa Joe without the scandal. Unbelievable. All right, um, guys, ha have a good time out there. I I'm uh, going to uh, vote right after the Mike Mayo lunchbox vote, vote, show. Please, please go vote. Yeah, we want you to get out there and, and give it a shot. Because it's hypocritical for us to make any kind of political commentary here, which we're, uh, you know, more than in favor of. Uh, I, I don't think it should be ignored. There, there was uh, an edict uh, that was brought down by all management and sports talk. Uh, do not mention anything about, like, Donald Trump or the presidency no. when right. all that's going on. And I'm thinking, hey, sports fans, uh, you know, uh, they're more diverse. I mean, it's not just, uh, you know, X's and O's that they want to talk about all day long. I mean, we're living our lives, too, right? Me? I'm trying to hang on to a little Social Security and Medicare. I like both of those things. I like freedom. I, I, I get Greece so. today, yeah. I, I, I like, I like uh, you know, th free thinking also. I mean, uh, how about, and, and the whole concept, what happened to, like, trying to get together? Maybe your ideas don't exactly jive with mine. But maybe we, we find some kind of common ground to uh, promote. How, how far of a concept is this? Common good. Yeah, whatever. Isn't that what government's supposed to uh, promote? Common good. They're, they're supposed to uh, go out of their way to... Find things that, that uh, make overall everybody's life better while you have all of the opportunity in the universe. So vote for those candidates. Yeah, yeah, good <laughs> uh, it's frightening, man. Costa Rica, man. I had Corbin on that one. He thought about it. <laughs> he definitely thought about it. <laughs> uh, you look great, Louie. I like the new look. I think you should stick with it. I really I believe this. A long-term look, but I'm glad you like it. I did you have it. to dig these glasses up out of some, uh, you know? Every night, I I, I don't like my wearing my contact before I go to bed. I just oh, okay. don't like glasses. I wore yeah. my whole life until college, and I just don't like them. They're Looks very intelligent. Them. I mean, it really I, does add an air of dignity to you that uh, I I think you know it kind of enhances your opinions today on the show. You notice <laughs> we weren't critical of anything that you said. It was great. All right, a lot of fun being with you today. Yeah, 12, uh, Mike Mayo's lunchbox, twelve o'clock. Uh, Mayo man, he'll be all over this uh, election thing. And uh, we kind of know where he stands. But he, he doesn't like to get into it because he's got the 92,000 people show. there. He doesn't really Unless he's South out. Florida, you know, and he starts saying, well, you know what? The meatball may have been dry, but you got to give it another chance. It's like, uh, come yeah. on, Mike. Take a he step. He doesn't get into politics much there. Yeah. I was going to say, you're not going to get much politics later on. He'll talk about voting and go out and vote. That's what he yeah. does. Vote. Go vote. That's his way of he's saying He's an advocate for the people. He is. Mike Mayo. All right. Well, uh, talk to Mike. He, he had more dining experiences. I see you had some posts 
there on Let's Eat South Florida. He had some uh, some kind of, uh, what was it? Garlic rolls he was talking about today. Nice. He eats a lot of bread, this cat. He, he? does like his carbs. Yes, he I mean, does. who doesn't? But uh, I, I don't know. You know, I, I'm starting to, uh, you know, try, try, you're trying your best to get away from it, right? Maybe uh, garlic roll, though, is irresistible, isn't it? And, and, and there are plenty of places that have good ones. But uh, he, he found something that was like a variation on a theme that uh, looks spectacular. All right. We'll see you later on, 12 o'clock today. Mike Mayo's Lunchbox. Thanks to Billy Corbin, John Kajemi, and Mike Luby Lubitz, the bespeckled one. I'm Jeff DeForest. Uh, thanks for tuning in and listening. We'll see you next time as we leave you know that. The time. When's this drawing going to be for the Powerball? Do we need to work tomorrow? I don't know. I think I've got this one. So 9.03. Let's go to eat a damn snack. Let's go to my show.